on my talk, it's precise versus bounded probability. And uh, I'm happy that you're you're joining. I can't. Uh, I won't. Uh, I I will let Simon interrupt if someone is raising your hand. Uh, please do. Uh, I'm planning to give this uh, uh, think over as a first. I gave an introduction for about uh, 30 minutes, and uh, then we have a discussion, and then um, we talk more about uh, how to sort of extend it precise to a boundary probability, and then we have a discussion again. And if someone is very interested in discussing the exactly solution to the challenge problem that uh, we posted on the website, you're, you're welcome to attend afterwards. But um, I won't go through any, any code in this talk because I think that we have enough stuff to, to sort of keep a discussion going um, uh, without uh, digging deeply in the code. Uh, but feel free to interrupt me if you want. So first, I have a declaration of interest, and uh, I am currently uh, working as a, a scientific expert at the European Food Safety uh, Authority on the implementation of, of uncertainty analysis and scientific assessments. But uh, what I'm presenting here are, are my own thoughts. It's not representative of, uh, of what else I think. Um, so why is uh, uncertainty important? Well, of course, um, uh, it's very odd if someone would say that I am 100% sure about something. So although uncertainty is very uncomfortable, it's not certainly uh, not uncertainty. And especially when we work with scientific assessments, and uh, uncertainty is, is very important. And uncertainty gives any limitations in knowledge, and therefore we call it epistemic. And uh, when we think about uncertainty, it's someone who is uncertain with the person. So, uh, and uncertainty changes as new knowledge becomes available, uh, and it varies between different people. And when we do scientific assessments, we, in a way, would like to produce a very good and valid scientifically sound report to the honest decision making. And uh, when I say scientific assessment, I mean a very structured scientific procedure uh, to come up with an answer to a question. And this question is relevant to a decision maker. And I am going to produce this in a way so the decision maker is willing to accept the answer as their own. And uh, if um, when we communicate uh, uh, our answer to a question, our uncertainty, or, or just rephrase it, our certainty about the answer is of importance, uh, or it should be important to decision makers. Uh, if the decision makers don't trust it, they can uh, they can sort of uh, go on and make decisions without this uh, support. Or if they if they trust it too much, while we are not communicating uncertainty honestly enough, uh, they may may come up with wrong decisions for that reason. So uh, no matter how we do it, we have to communicate uncertainty as honestly as possible, not over, not exaggerating it and not under exaggerating. Parameters and variables in assessments. Uh, so once I have set up my assessment model, uh, the parameters are things in my assessment model. It's numbers which have fixed values within the assessment model. Uh, parameters, they exist in the model. Um, and if I, would, if I would choose another model, uh, I would have other parameters. But of course, there can be parameters that, that has a meaning that sort of exists in, in many different models. And uncertain about these parameters, they are epistemic. It's something that we are uncertain about, something that has a fixed value that we are uncertain about. So here's an example of, of a model, and uh, it's uh, the guess what, the normal, a normally distributed assessment variable. It has two parameters, the mean and the variance. Uh, and uh, it's uh, this is the terminology I'm using, nothing uh, very extraordinary, I would say. So when I think about probability as a measure of uncertainty, as a, of epistemic uncertainty, there are many different interpretations of probability out there. And uh, probability as a concept appear, uh, has been along for a very long time. And here, is, here I mentioned some uh, mathematicians or philosophers that are discussing probability as a measure of uncertainty. And what we see are that, that there are different rationals for is sometimes they think of it as in a classical sense that you have a, um, 
a, a set of equal chances on different uh, uh, things to be drawn from an urn. Uh, you have uh, the idea of um, uh, objective probabilities, subjective probabilities, uh, that you implement probability as part of decision theory. Uh, Kolmogorov just set up probability as a, as, a, as a mathematical measure without any specific interpretation. And, uh, and uh, definitely argued for uh, subjective probability as a uh, measure through games, uh, and so on. And when we work with probability as measure uncertainty, uh, we, we, we can sort of have to make a, a decision uh, where we, how we want to use it. So first of all, one can think of it, do we see object, uh, probability as something subjective or objective? Uh, if it's subjective, it sort of falls in line with the idea of uncertainty because someone is uncertainty. So why can't we see uh, a measure of this uncertainty as uh, something subjective? Um, and it is subjective in a sense that, that it, uh, it requires someone to make a judgment to start. Uh, the use of objective probabilities are intended to sort of get away from the subjectivity in assessment, but I will come back to that later. Uh, another idea is how these subjective probabilities are to be interpreted. Uh, in general, one can think of it as that we interpret this as a, someone's degree of belief, and whether it comes from a betting interpretation or this earn analogy, it, it doesn't really change how we do the assessment. It's more about the interpretation. Uh, so we have we have this uh, view that we have a model, we have a probability distribution for uh, the variables taking different values, uh, conditional on the parameters, and then we have our measure of uncertainty, which are the probabilities, uh, a probability distribution for the parameters, right? Uh, and uh, I would say that the the probability distribution for the parameters is, rep is a quantification of epistemic uncertainty, whereas the probability distribution for variables uh, given parameters could be epistemic or aleatory. Depends on, on, on the context. So here is uh, an, an example of a model where I, I have my uh, variable x, conditional on the parameters, uh, and then I, when I sort of add my uncertainty to the parameters, I assign probability distribution to the, the mean and the variance. And when I describe my, uh, uh, dis my uncertainty about the mean, for example, the me in this case, it, it can also be described by a normal distribution with parameters. But these are then hyperparameters, which is indicated here with a, a zero. Uh, I don't, sometimes you just collapse the condition and on parameters and have it like this. I can present my, my model as a, in, a, in a graph like this, where the, the dire direction of the arrows indicate the conditional probabilities. And uh, uh, when we do the assessment, we may have uh, the aim to sort of summarize our uncertainty about a specific parameter, for example, whether the, the mean is lower than one. We could also be interested, and that is, I think, quite common in, in, in risk assessment applications, that we are interested in a function of the parameters. For example, age is a function of uh, mu and sigma, and we want to know whether this value of this function is less than one. Uh, and here I define my function as the situation where the variable x uh, is lower than one. So if you compare, in the first case, we want to know whether the, the, the expected value of x is less than one. And in the second case, we want to know whether the variable itself takes a value less than one. So x could here be uh, 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 the concentration uh, of, of a dangerous substance. And uh, when I do risk assessment, I want to know how likely it is that, that the concentration is, is, um, is sure, is not exceeding a, a critical threshold among the population. I am less interested in knowing whether the average person in the population, whether it, it is less than the threshold. 
So uh, to, I, I'm now collapsing the, the distribution for the parameters into a joint probability distribution for the parameters. And when I have this uh, function of parameters, I can just add it as an extension uh, coming out from the variables in the model. Now this is a very simplified example where I only have one, one variable and attached a set of parameters. But when we work with um, real problems, we have plenty of variables and each of these variables have parameters attached to them. Uh, so in this case, the function X, A, H, it can be a, a model for, for risk. It could be a model expressing a utility. It could be something that has nothing to do with how data has been, uh, what data is informing the model. And note that so far, I'm not having any, any data in this model. So it's, it's purely a probabilistic framework to uh, where uncertainty is, is described by subjective probability and then propagated through a model. And whether you can call this model a Bayesian model or not, uh, I'm not using Bayes rule here, as you can see. Um, but uh, in some ways, since I'm using subjective probability, one could call it a, a Bayesian model, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's at least a model where uncertainty is treated by, by subjective probability. Uh, and coming back to the perspective on what the meaning of the um, distribution of variables condition on parameters, whether this is epistemic or lettery. And I would say that the um, um, the interpretation of this as aleatory is something which I would sort of coin the assessment perspective uh, of this. Uh, and uh, one can say that the, the distribution for the variables, conditional parameters, they represent aleatory uncertainty. Uh, and, and therefore, these probabilities are interpreted as relative frequencies. And this is also sometimes called the subjectivity subjective probability and relative frequency approach in the risk literature. Uh, and if we, if we sort of take a step back and look at this in a, in a, in a Bayesian framework, um, uh, both variables and parameters are mathematically random variables, but they represent different types of uncertainty. And, uh, and uh, the question is, is this really possible to keep the separation, but still have give them the same type of uh, mathematical uh, formulation? Uh, and uh, does this perspective apply when we, when we have made observations? So is the interpretation of the, this, the probability for data given conditional parameters also uh, aleatory uh, as well? Um, so these are questions that, that one can discuss. And if we're going to explain the Bayesian inference, how do we get the probabilities in the first place? How do we go from expert knowledge and data to some quantification of a probability? Well, uh, the probability as a measure of uncertainty, it, it sort of, first of all, it sort of represents the assessor's uncertainty. Uh, so we start by, by expressing it, getting it out from our head. And as an assessor, you can consult one or several experts to do this. And uh, it, it's good if one is using some uh, structured process for expert knowledge dissertation to avoid the uh, so biases and things that, that may occur when, when one is working with experts. Um, and if we have several experts, uh, there is a need to aggregate this into one probability distribution at the end using behavioral or mathematical aggregation. Uh, so, for example, uh, one expert says that, uh, okay, uh, if you would ask me, uh, I could say that uh, the value on, on this parameter mu is, is less than three with a probability of 50%. And uh, uh, it's bigger than uh, 0 0.15 with a probability of 95%. So these are uh, probabilities that I get from the expert. And based on this information, I can find a distribution that is suitable for this parameter. In this case, uh, I choose a normal distribution. And uh, then I find uh, hyperparameters that corresponds to the probabilities that I got from the expert. In this case, I actually find a perfect agreement because I only had two probabilities from the expert. So in this way, I have gone from asking the expert, I got something from them, and I, I specify a, a, a probability distribution for this unknown quantity. 
And uh, so the expert doesn't have to sort of provide me a mean or a median. It's enough if they provide me some points from the cumulative distri uh, distribution function. And when we do Bayesian inference, it's like a statistical theory that where we learn from data, where epistemic uncertainty is quantified by uh, probability, and it's possible to specify a probabilistic model for data. If we don't have a probabilistic model for data, we can't do Bayesian inference. Uh, and usually this probabilistic model for data uh, is it's called a likelihood and uh, it's taken for as known. Um, we don't uh, put any uncertainty on this model. Uh, and uh, then we have our distribution for the parameters before data is seen and it's also called a prior. And then we do apply Bayesian base rule to update and then we get the, uh, the posterior distribution for the parameters uh, given data. And by having this framework, it's very flexible and it allows us to integrate expert knowledge as the prior with data. Uh, and you can also do sequential updating as data becomes available. Uh, we can propagate uncertainty through every corner in this assessment model by probability calculus. And uh, we can do updating analytically, for example, using conjugate models or approximately by MCMC or ABC, as example. Uh, so let's just look at the posterior for the example that we have. So we still have the normal distributed X. And uh, to simplify, we assume that the value on the sigma is known. And then uh, we have some independent data. And now I changed the model a bit to indicate that, uh, that uh, some things are observed or known. So let's say that we have two tasks. We want to quantify uncertainty about the, the value on, uh, the, on me, the expected value. And we, make a, we want to make a conclusion uh, whether mu exceeds one. Uh, I have made a, a misprint. It should be a conclusion whether x exceeds one, sorry. Okay, so I start with my prior. And since this is a very, very nice model, it's a conjugate model for normal, uh, with, for normal distribution with non-variance, I can immediately derive the posterior without doing any complicated calculations. So the distribution for uh, the mu parameter uh, is this um, uh, normal distributed with uh, mu one and, and uh, sigma one, where mu one and sigma one are given according to these uh, expressions. And so you can see the uh, the updated the posterior uh, mu value here uh, is is a weighted average of the prior mean and it, and the mean in data. And it's weighted according to the, uh, the width of the prior and of the, um, uh, and of the, and how much I trust data or how much variability I expect in data. For the second problem, uh, I wanted to make a conclusion whether X, note it was X exceeds one. So I take my function h, which is which was previously defined at the, the, the probability that x exceeds one. And then I can calculate this by plugging it into the normal uh, distribution and take the integral from one to infinity over the density function for normal distribution, where I, I, I enter the posterior uh, hyperparameters. Right. And uh, so I'm making inference about this uncertain quantity and I have noticed uh, mm, some, uh, there is, there was something in my equation which was not exactly right. Sorry for that. But uh, what I wanted to say before was that, uh, that we, um, we can make inference about the parameter uh, by doing, deriving the posterior. And if you ignore the misprint here, we can then make inference about the uh, quantity of interest by uh, using the posterior and propagating it through the model. So here are some examples where, uh, where we see the, the prior in, in blue and the posterior. We have a small error on, on data. 
uh, and then if we have a to the left on the upper left we have a fairly precise uh, prior and when we update uh, having one data point we also have a kind of it, something is happening there and if we have a super flat prior uh, the um, it doesn't have much on the posterior it looks uh, fairly similar to the the one uh, to the left uh, but the one to the left is is more closely to the to the mean of the prior because it is uh, an average of that and if we have a large error if they if we don't trust data that much uh, then the updating goes much slower so here we can see that we have three data points and when we have more data points. So the prior matter and uh, the informativeness in, in data matter, everything matters. And we can't get around that. So as I said before, when we do assessments, we are more likely, we are interested in, in parameters, not certain about parameters, but it's very often that we want to know uncertainly about the quantitative interest uh, so let's say that we're interested in this uh, quantity h, which is defined as the probability that uh, our variable exceeds one. Okay. And uh, uncertainty about this quantum interest is the probability of h. So if I, if I use this concept predict distribution, which is uh, existing in, in the Bayesian literature, it is the probability uh, of um, a new observation of x conditional on data so it's basically a probability distribution for the variable after we have seen the data and learned about parameters uh, but if we look at the predictive distribution uh, as it is derived it's uh, it's usually um, um, uh, it's integrating everything down to the marginal on, on the x variable, which means that it is combining uncertainty about x and uncertainty about the parameters. And therefore, it is a mixture of aleatory and epistemic uncertainty. If we didn't have the assessment perspective, it will only be epistemic. Right. But uh, now we are focusing on uh, trying to separate aleatory and epistemic uncertainty because we know that that has an implication for the conclusions that are made. So what can we do instead of looking at the predicted distribution? Well, we can propagate uncertainty to the model, to this quantity H. And if we're gonna find something that would correspond to predictive distribution, it would be something that we call a two-dimensional distribution or a spaghetti plot. So uh, it's called spaghetti plot because it looks like spaghetti, but it's basically that we are uh, for different uh, draws, random draws of, uh, from the probability distribution for the parameters. We are uh, thinking in terms of for every draw parameters, we, we can sort of visualize a, um, the distribution for X. And if we make random draws of the parameters from the, the probability distribution of the parameters representing epistemic uncertainty, we get, we get this two dimension distribution where the gray line describes uh, aleatory uncertainty and uh, the differences or the sample of the gray lines represent epistemic uncertainty. And uh, if we are thinking about getting uncertainty in the quantity of interest, um, uh, if we would go for the predict distribution, which is the blue line here. Uh, I turn it to the ascending uh, cumulative density function because we want to know whether it uh, is bigger, bigger than one or not. Here is one, the black line is one. If we take the blue line, uh, uh, the predicted distribution is only one distribution. And if I would, um, if I would sort of uh, calculate the probability that this exceeds one, it's one value. And in this case, it's approximately 44. There is no uncertainty in this quantity if I use the predicted distribution. So therefore, if we instead go for the alternative to propagate uncertainty to H, 
it means that we are sampling uh, distributions for for um, x uh, over the parameter space, and for every this for every this sample of of gray lines, we derive uh, the probability that x exceeds uh, one, and then we get an we get an uncertainty in in this probability that x exceeds one or h. And this quantitative interest set here, it is, seems to be very uncertain. So if I would, for example, uh, summarize this uncertainty by taking the expected value, I would get 34, which is not identical to 44. And I could summarize it into a, a probability or a credible interval, which would say that uh, I'm 95% 95, 95 certain that the quantitative interest lies between two and 85%. So I, I therefore argue that, that when, when we are working with Bayesian inference, it could happen that, that uh, we, we miss this important part that we, if we have to figure out what, uh, what is the quantity that we are interested in and how can we summarize uncertainty in that quantity uh, and still keep a letter and epistemic uncertainty apart. So predictive distributions uh, does not really apply in this context, but predictive distributions are very useful to validate models uh, and, uh, and to sort of make, uh, sometimes it is relevant to make a, a, a prediction uh, of uh, the distribution or, or what values a future observation may take. All right. Um, so if the quantitative interest is not a parameter like uh, mu or sigma then uh, if we have this perspective it will prevent the, the percentage it, it will prevent us from mixing a letter and epistemic uncertainty so first of all we take our assessment model and then we do something which i call bayesian calibration of the parameters and uh, this could be like in one is doing backward sampling or inverse modeling or Bayesian updating. So one, one is having the whatever data we can get hold on. We specify models for how data has been in generated. Uh, and whether this is seen as epistemic or lettery, it's, it's not that important at the moment, I think. Uh, and once we have updated our parameters, we, uh, we specify the, the, a model that can derive the quantity of interest. And then we get, um, uh, we can sort of propagate uh, this uh, uncertainty about the parameters through our model. And when we have this forward uh, sampling perspective, the probability that the variables take different values, uh, conditional parameters, that's, that's interpreted as a letter uncertainty. And then the probability in the, any quantity of interest is interpreted as epistemic. So here it's important that I actually do separation. I got a question from Ander. Can you say it? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting just that the predictive distribution isn't a member of the second order distribution. And I was wondering whether it should be or could it be? Or why isn't it? You mean that uh, you would expect that this blue line would be embedded in the gray lines? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't see that the, it has to be because they are derived in different ways. Mm. Uh, it, 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 uh, it could depend on the model I have. In this case, the model is, uh, is very, it, it's, it's uh, I haven't looked exactly at the relationship between predictive distributions and the uh, two dimensional distributions, but um, it, it, could, it could be that the predictive distribution is a shortcut and that, that it would sort of uh, be enough for the assessment. But uh, my argument here is that if we, if we use the predictive distribution, we are breaking the separation between a, a letter and epistemic uncertainty, and then we, we stop communicating epistemic uncertainty. So we don't, we don't have any possibility to, to sort of 
come up with a conclusion that we're 95 percent certain that uh, that this yeah. um, a quantity would exceed uh, one we only get one value right thanks uh, um, so, yes. so i just want to comment if you do have a question and you want to jump in that's completely fine if you unmute and ask a question yeah yeah of course yeah matthias uh, sure yeah I, I i think the way it works is that the if i understand it correctly is that the um predictive is kind of a weighted average of all the gray lines so it, it combines all the gray lines together by kind of integrating over them uh that's how it should work is that is that right Ulrika? yeah so that so it will never be in there but it will always kind of look like an average of those lines but i must say the plot looks a little bit strange okay um, it could be that this plot has um, it's not correct yeah yeah i'm not sure also i would also think the expectation um yeah uh, why that expectation is different i guess that 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 i don't quite understand but that might ha may have to do with how you how you did the uh, uh calculation um yeah. Thanks. Uh, even, even if the expectations were uh, similar, uh, we still have uncertainty about the yeah. quantitative yeah. interest. So it's uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but but uh, point taken, the blue line may be too uh, uh, treated badly in this case. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Sorry. Uh, what I'm describing here, where we basically have a first uh, a calibration step where we sort of inform parameters of our assessment model using whatever information we have available, and then we propagate uncertainty about the parameters uh, to the model that via the model that we're interested in, which doesn't have to be the same one as we used for the calibration, uh, to whatever quantity of interest. Uh, this is a this is a, a type of application of Bayesian inference, uh, which which I have seen called Bayesian evidence synthesis, uh, and and it, it sort of it sort of has the idea that we want to sort of bring all possible sources of evidence together to m inform our assessment model, and then we can propagate it into uh, whatever cost benefit, um, utility, or or uh, uh, risk. Uh, uh, measures that that we that we need to support decision making and when we when we do it in this way uh, uh, we can sort of quantify uncertainty by subjective probability and separate the electron epistemic uncertainty uh, to support this um, uh, seminar we had specified some uh, challenge problems and uh, uh, the first one of them is similar to the one I presented. It's a bit different, but we still have only one quantity and it's sort of no normal distributed, but it's log normal. And then we have uh, uh, specified different deviations from this. Uh, so first of all, we want to know what is the, what is the uncertainty about that the, the x exceeds a certain threshold. And then we get uncertainty, we get information from experts, we have uh, problems with observations that the, there are some uh, censored data. Uh, we have some uh, caveats about how data has been collected and if we can consider that. Uh, and then we have some other data from a different source um, uh, for, for a different variable and we want to combine that. And in the last one, we we, we have some dependency between uh, two variables and how to take that into account. I won't go through the so solutions to this now, and it's, it's, it's open for you but, uh, to stay afterwards, but, but I can say that uh, a, Bayesian, a Bayesian analysis quantifying with subjective probability can approach all of these issues that are presented here. Um, and the question is whether it's enough, but uh, because one has to make some uh, assumptions at some point, uh, but I'm open to discuss it if anyone is interested after the, of, at the end of the talk. We also have another set of challenge problems, which is uh, about, um, um, it's more about discrete variables, uh, where we have a model that is uh, uh, combining probabilities or events. 
Okay, but to con continue, uh, I would like to, before I open up for, for a broad discussion, in what way is probability a good or a bad way to quantify epistemic uncertainty? Uh, so what I just told you is that I, I, I tried to sort of make a, a brief introduction to subjective probability as a way to quantify epistemic uncertainty. And by subjective probability, I mean a precise probability. And I mean, and it sort of sparks the whole Bayesian machinery where one can sort of update, integrate expert knowledge and, um, and, uh, and data. And it's a very flexible approach. And now I want to hear your thoughts about in what way this is a good or a bad way to quantify epistemic uncertainty. And um, I asked, um, so I open, I open up the floor to, to post, you can post in the, in the chat window suggestions, or you can, uh, yeah, let's put in the chat window if you have any suggestions. In what way is this good or bad? I can tell you, I've listened to previous seminars in this series, and uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussions about um, saying that the Bayesian, uh, um, Bayesian probabilities, uh, the Bayesian approach to quantum uncertainty doesn't work. So I'm expecting to hear some statements about this. Yeah, so if you've got any uh, questions, well, you can unmute Mike and jump in. But um, yeah, I see Alex actually has his hand raised up. So yeah, do you have a question, Alex? Uh, I would, it was more just to, I don't know, kick, kick things off and throw in the, the spicy frequentist grenade of um, <laughs> just asking the question, like, yeah, how, how probability can capture uncertainty? It's because it's, it's, it's not a probability about the epistemic, uh, it, it doesn't seem like an appropriate way of measuring epistemic uncertainty because you're trying to infer some knowledge about which you have uncertainty, but it is what it already is. You can assign a belief to it, but it feels like that belief is something fundamentally very different to a probability. And at that point, it's not calling it a probability, it doesn't feel particularly appropriate but I mean like there are um, it might just it might just be a semantic thing you can assign whether you want to draw the distinction between like beliefs and probabilities but I don't know on from my end it feels like trying to assign a belief to a, a probability sorry to an epistemic uncertainty why is that so um, difficult? I think for me, it feels inappropriate because you're trying to infer something about a, a given state that is already set. So there's no there's not so much mm -hmm. probabilities involved um, because things are already set as they are. You can assign probability, like you can look at, and I'll say this, I'm like my head is full of um, like confidence interval things at the moment. So yeah. You could look at confidence intervals and use those as an approach to understanding the epistemic uncertainty, but they're not, they don't really have anything to do with probabilities. It's, you're not assigning probabilities to the state of the world. You're just imagining like an infinite series of similar worlds and saying, well, I want to be X confident that I'm correct in a certain proportion of those but it's it's still not a probability because the fact because of the fact that you're trying to infer something about a fixed world mm -hmm. but then i suppose if if you're looking at predictions going forward then that doesn't hold perhaps i i don't know 
Alex, can I interject? Yep. Is your objection because the the event only happens once, or the the the, the assessment, the thing we're assessing only happens once, so there's no frequency you can basically quantify a probability over. But if you go to say the horse racing, that that race only happens once, right? But the way yeah. they calculate the the gambles and expectations and things that it still uses the same calculus, right? And it seems to work. Yeah, yeah, and it it might be just a semantic foible mm. on my part that it feels cold, like because in in horse races, yeah, they will use the same sort of calculus, but again, it feels it's it's not so much a probability as a again it looking at like levels of confidence and in a frequency sense over a long series you can be consistent to a certain degree but if if something only happens once mm. okay. I, 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 I don't know it feels just odd the, the meaning of assigning a probability to a single event okay um it uh, it is very how to say um I, I i personally don't find it to be uh difficult it could be something that one has to learn to do to get custom to do it could uh, it could be difficult to to begin with but i mean if 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 you have a uh, an event or, or if you have a barrier a parameter uh, like uh, a number, the, the number of uh, cows in Sweden. Mm -hmm. uh, if you would, if you were to sort of uh, describe your uncertainty about that number, you could say that with a certain probability, I think this number is above uh, hundred thousand. You you could sort of theoretically you could say that, and. Uh, uh, and if you would, for example, say that I think that the number is between 100,000 and, uh, uh, or I think the number is bigger than 100,000. What if it's a uh, little less than that? Then you would be wrong. So uh, using probability, uh, especially for continuous variables, allows you to sort of uh, have a have an expression of uncertainty which is balancing b between uh, being um, uh, including all possible cases and 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 putting a, a probability mass on the values that you really think are are more likely than others um, and, and um, so so uh, the, and it also it also boils down to uh, when when you're assigning probability to numbers it is of, often that you have to you can it's enough that you make a statement about uh, a single precise probability with a certain probability it exceeds hundred thousand you don't have to say or you don't have to specify the whole distribution you can just say something like that um, yeah I, I think it it may be just a semantic thing on my part that I, I I'd see those kind of statements more statements of like especially coming from the Bayesian point it's statements of belief rather than a statement of probability. But would you agree I that guess... uncertainty is personal and subjective? I mean, the, the interpretation of uncertainty, yeah, but if you're calculating, if you're, if you're actually looking at calculating fixed parameters from a given data set, that's not necessarily a personal uncertainty an individual can have a personal uncertainty and personal belief that they apply um given a like that would be their their like prior that they would bring into the situation but yeah it, it's it's not necessarily a probability at that point <laughs> yeah uh, so, so let 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 me rephrase. When I when I introduced uh, the, uh, the the concept of precise probability here, oh. I deliberately started to talk about precise probability without referring to data at all. So it is basically uh, we can work with precise probability without having data. 
and uh, and of course uh, as soon as you get data as soon as you have empirical evidence it's it's always going to inform uh, and up, I'm going to update my uncertainty and of course it's going to go in the direction where evidence points uh, but in order to in order to do that in order to get the um, uh, to use this theoretical framework we have to start somewhere and the starting point is that we have to express uh, uncertainty based on what is in our, in our head and if we go for if we if for example we go to the objective uh, trying to be more objective using non informative if if such or flat priors uh, that works very well if we have uh, lots of data if there is a lot of information in data the, the flat priors will basically be overruled by data and that's not a problem but in many cases when we are doing assessment uh, it um, it uh, we don't have this massive amount of data. To kind of uh, jump in and uh, agree with, uh, I guess Alex here, I I don't think probably to me like the difference between the uncertainty in your head and the true uncertainty of that ever thing that is what I characterize as epistemic uncertainty, and like I definitely see a difference between say the probability of rolling a die, which is very fixed versus the probability that a certain team is going to win a baseball game because that event is only going to be played once. And so it's interesting to me then to ask the question, well, what's the true probability in both of those cases? And the probability of rolling a die, you can get the true probability because you can perform, we kind of consider each event independent from the others, but they all pull from the same distribution, but you can't replay that baseball game millions and millions of times. And so it's kind of like, a, okay, are there other words here that we need to describe those two different types of probability. And I know historically, we seem to like the, the probability of uh, gambling because that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. And so we're, that's where it's like very fixed and there is an obvious true probability. Rolling like three ones with, is it more probable to roll three ones with one run with one die or three ones with three die or whatever the Newton Peeps problem was. And one of the things that I, I found often frustrating is that when people talk about epistemic uncertainty, I feel like they don't go far enough. Like early on in your presentation, you assume something was normal. I yeah. would challenge that's an epistemic uncertainty. Yes. How have you addressed that? Yeah. And a lot of times it's not. And, in, um, and it's like how, I mean, to me, a huge epistemic uncertainty is when we assume distributions of things and like, well, how do you test that to see if that's the real distribution? And it's a lot of times it's not tested or discussed. And I, I feel like there's other words and other concepts that are needed to describe these things, because I do think that if, if probability is something that is more personal and not, or uncertainty is more personal and not objective, it's not really a science. I mean, to make it the science area, it has to become very objective. So all parties can look in and say, this is the true uncertainty for the situation. Whether we yeah. actually know it or not is different. But uh, I don't agree with you that there is such a thing as a true uncertainty, and we're trying to get as close to it as, as possible. Uh, what what is uh, what makes the assessment scientific is that uh, that we are using scientific approaches to to come up with uh, an honest characterization of uncertainty. So it could be, for example, that we are uh, uh, using uh, good evidence or valid evidence. We are. Um, selecting or building models that have been tested, validated, and if we are unsure about whether X is normally distributed or something else, we can we can consider uh, these as alternative models and make inference over that. Uh, so so that is uh, that type of uncertainty that you're talking about is something that we definitely should consider, but it's not. Uh, it's not an argument against using uh, uh, subjective probability to quantify uncertainty. On the contrary, if we if we uh, if we claim that there is such a thing as a true uncertainty, who are right, you or me? Because we have different well, knowledges available. It would be well, me. <laughs> yeah. But can't you define something to have a true uncertainty? I mean, can I say that X has this probability measure 
Um, it's defined by that and that probability measure, therefore that value of X we're uncertain of and we know exactly because I've defined it. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that classify as a true uncertainty? And you, and you could test your approach against that assumption, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, well, well then, but, that, but that, it would, would, wouldn't that, the, the answer to, to that bit, it would depend on the type of uncertainty. So, so there is a sense that if you roll a dice, you could roll it a million times, and then you can therefore be pretty sure that you've seen um, all, you've seen it six times, and they're all about a six, and so therefore you're pretty sure that you know what those probabilities are. If you have a, a sports match, and it only happens once, then you could never really be sure what the true probabilities at the start were. And after the event, you could therefore still never be sure. You, you are coming back to this example where you talk about uncertainty about a unique event. And that is a very special case, I would say. Uh, so uh, it is something different from being uncertain about parameters, uh, something which has a true number, but we are uncertain about it and expressing uncertainty in, in uh, random outcomes, like variables taking different values uh, due to chance. Uh, but unique events are something uh, different. And uh, when, when we work with, us, with uh, assessments, it could be that what we are studying hasn't happened yet. It's a unique event. What is the, we're gonna say something about the probability of, of a terrorist attack somewhere where it hasn't happened before. And that can, in a sense, be a, a unique event. But um, the way we do that could then be that we are uh, thinking of this uh, event as a, as a derived, uh, uh, like I, I mentioned, quantitative interest. So it, it's no longer something that comes out of, of uh, randomness. It's, it's, um, uh, we define it as, as, a, as a derived quantity that we are uncertain about. And uh, so, so it, it, um, there is a variables are usually things that, that one can sample that, that sort of take different values. And to use probabilities for this, I don't think any one of you have problems with that. Uh, and the, the question is how, if we're gonna use probabilities to, to sort of express our uncertainty about uh, this characterization of this uh, variability. Yeah. Um, sorry, Joshua, you want to go? For well, I, I guess I just wanted to add, like, uh, I definitely think there are times when you can use probability measures to express epistemic uncertainty, but there are other times when you can't. And like I what? feel like there are other examples when you can't use a probability measure or you can't use a probability to, me to represent epistemic uncertainty. Can you mention one example? Sure. In my, I literally, well, here, I'll show you. Just because I have nothing better. In my hand, I have a fair die and an unfair die. <laughs> so if I roll the unfair die, how do you, this is epistemic uncertainty. How do you use a probability measure to represent the uncertainty? I'll tell you it's got sides one through six, so you know all the outcomes. But how do you actually, I mean, that's why I actually bought a ton of loaded die to try to understand this better. You can't, I mean, there's no, you can assume a probability distribution, you can assume uniform, I can guarantee you it's not uniform, but other than that, you have an epistemic uncertainty, the value of the die, and you can't assign a probability distribution to it that, especially, unless you actually perform the Bayesian updating, I guess, and get data. But if I don't give you any data other than it's an unfair die, how do you do the analysis there? And that's where I know I've, I've focused a lot on because I, we live in worlds where you only have a very small fixed amount of data or you have literally no data and you know, yeah. well, I know the minimum value is this, the maximum is that, and that's all I got. So what you're saying is that you have problems coming up with a, a good model for, uh, for the, I mean, you have a, you know the number of sites, but you don't, you know it's unfair. And then you, you have no idea on how to sort of come up with a sensible way of expressing your uncertainty about the different probabilities on this. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, uh, but that that would be a problem in in all cases uh, where the solution will be to throw it, <laughs> learn. But, 
well, yes, and how you can. How you learn? But bef but what I'm interested in are, I guess, the 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 uncertainty quantification that you could do if you couldn't throw the die. And like, how how do you? I mean, like, once you, once you can develop, once you can test any uh, random variable enough to determine its distribution, then yes, by all means, use the distribution. But there are so many distributions or random variables where not only can you not test, but the data you get is really bad. Like I know yeah. my understanding from expert elicitation is that the only analysis that's been done on it is that when they do expert elicitation, it's usually wrong, where there's one expert who's right and um, usually, but you don't know who it is, and it's usually not the idea that, oh, if everybody agrees, they're right. Now, I haven't been able to, like, track down that paper, but from talking with the PRA people, I know that was one of the concerns. And so if you get data, you have to, like, say, okay, is this really good quality data that I'm going to trust, or is it better just to assume, yeah, this isn't really giving me new information. I'm just going to use the fact that we know the minimum value is this or the maximum value is this. How do I progress forward doing that uncertainty? as opposed to actually going out and getting those distributions, which I, I may not be able to do. I, I, does that make sense to anyone else? Oh, I guess math is cool. Sorry, Joshua. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Joshua, just to clarify your question, you're saying that there isn't like a, a, a what you call an appropriate model to sort of like, like um, quantify and model your initial guess as to how the die would be thrown uh, or, or how, how do you, how do you know, how about the chances of the different faces popping up. Is that part of well, your question? Yeah, I kind, kind of like this. I mean, so here I have a, yeah. uh, a loaded die and I say, hey, let's have a bet. Yeah. I'm going to roll it. If I roll a six, you give me $1,000. If I roll right. anything but a six, I give you $1,000. And mm -hmm. obviously don't take the bet because this was a really cheaply loaded die and yeah, it's specifically yeah. loaded to roll a six. But that situation is paralleled in a lot of other cases and there's many situations where you can never actually roll the die to determine how it's loaded. I mean, I think of things like the space shuttle uh, idea with nuclear reactor safety. There's atomic weapons where you do have these unknown distributions. You know something about them, like you know the minimum to maximum values. You know the values it can take. But then how do you perform the uncertainty assessment in those respects when you can't go out and test and develop the distribution and you still have to make the bet. You either have I, to send the space shuttle up or not. From. Okay. Because initially I thought initially I thought the answer to your question would be to just assume uniform distribution, but that doesn't really solve the root of the problem. If you want to let's say like like have a precise model that models the the, the way that your die behaves. Well, and I chose this example specifically yeah. because if you assume a uniform distribution and you treat this die fairly, mm -hmm. you're going to say, I'm going to make that bet every time. This guy's going to owe me $1,000. Correct. Correct. If, if you actually did that and we did it, you'd end up but, paying but me a lot of thing, money every roll. Right. I, yeah. I get you. But then here's the thing, prior distributions, because the idea of a prior is, is that you, you, you actually model your knowledge before you make any observations. So before you make any, like whether it's a loaded die or a, uh, what you call a uh, fair die, Usually before that, you wouldn't know until you, you play the game. And the prior distribution sort of like, like models what you know about the die before you do any measurement. So what we are actually quantifying is what you know before you, you, you do really know the details of the, this die. You only start knowing when you like start to throw the dice and then you realize that, hey, okay, this is unfair. This is, this is fair. This is not fair kind of thing. Yeah. No, I, no, I agree. Go ahead. Yeah. But, but, but Adolfo, surely draw, drawing that so really you have no knowledge about the die. So all you yep. can really say is the probability that it is six is between zero and one. It is, it is an interval. It, we, interval is, right. we, know it, we know it can't be more than one and it can't be less than zero. Yes. So that's all we know. That's all and we therefore, know. therefore the probability that it's not one is maybe sort of zero to one. So therefore you don't know anything about it. But that's I why do it's not a non know anything about this dice. Right, that's why it's a non-informative, that's why it's a non-informative prior to begin with. That's of it. But, but why not, but why not just use, just use the interval in it? What do you yeah, mean? Why do, you, why you can as well, you can as well. Just, it's, it's, I'm just suggesting like an, uh, an approach. You can also use interval to, to do that. There's no hard or fast rule to actually approach this, this problem. I think I think it would be um, like like you know either way you can probably do the analysis 
but what I was just coming from is more of like like the uh, you know if let's say you have you want to use a model to sort like define it, but intervals would probably work as well. Yeah. So 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 the example that that Joshua brought up it is uh, it is very um, it's interesting, and it points to a, a fact that uh, there is a if one would use a precise probability to to express uncertainty about this, it it uh, sort of uh, it has some issues. On the other hand, the problem is uh, is uh, is not uh, similar, or maybe it's similar to the problems you're working with, Joshua. But but uh, total data free, uh, with no prior knowledge about the system and so on, it it's it is. Um, I would expect that 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 is uh, not that often happening when when one is doing risk assessments, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, so I think that in many cases, uh, using subjective probability to quantify or precise probability to quantify, uh, uh, since it allows us to sort of uh, uh, combine integrate data from many different sources on many different variables uh, it, um, uh, it it's it's sort of a, it, it's a very useful approach and if you would if you would have that type of assessment Joshua would would you then be able to consider uh, using um, uh, precise probability to quantify epistemic uncertainty well I, I mean I know in a lot of cases we do I'm thinking um, it, you know, where I deal with the, like breaks of large pipes for nuclear power reactors, um, where I mean th there's almost no data on that, and a lot of times they use expert elicitation. So like five experts go into a room and they say, "Hey, the answer is ten to the negative six. Why is it that? I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, what, so one of my questions is, well, how good is expert elicitation at actually guessing the reality of things? And I, I haven't seen many studies, and what I've heard is not that it's, it's that good, but I, I don't know. Um, but it's also, um, I, I get to review uncertainty quantification methods in my job. And one of the things that has always bugged me um, is the reliance on the underlying distribution. Like I feel like in, um, uh, and I think you did this when you combined all of those cumulative distributions into that one distribution on the second to last slide, I'm assuming you assumed that all the distributions were equally likely. And that's how you sampled to get the the PDF. Is that was that correct? Yeah, I I, uh, I did a yeah. I did a Monte Carlo sampling. Yeah, and and I know like I mean I, I remember when I first started going into this and really digging into Bayes' paper and where he makes this offhanded statement uh, something like if you don't know you just assume all are equally as likely, and I I really feel like that's bringing a lot of information to the table that. It's, I mean, it's an assumption and sometimes you need to make an assumption to move forward, but like how sensitive is that distribution to that assumption? What if you assume that a certain set of distributions was more likely than others? Would that PDF have dramatically shifted? And then the question is, how likely is it that all distributions are equally likely or there are a set of distributions that are more likely than others and how do you know? And I'm personally finding that I'm certainly at my limits of knowledge but also the the terminology to kind of like go back to what um uh, alexander was talking about at the beginning i do feel like there's a huge difference between a probability of an event where there is likely a true probability that we can easily understand like the role of a die where i think most people would say if you have a die you can develop the true probability distribution and to me that's behaves differently than like the probability of of a rare event like who wins a baseball game where you can't really replay that over and over again. And it's, it's almost like, should we be using probability measures in both cases or should there be a different way to interpret it? And I mean, this is what I'm thinking of and writing on my whiteboard in my comp yep. office and stuff like that. So what, what I would say about that last point is, as I tried to say before, that, that uh, it's usually quantifying epistemic uncertainty by probability is usually about expressing uncertainty in parameters. Uh, and these parameters are often uh, continuous variables, uh, continuous uh, numbers. So uh, um, the probability of very rare events uh, 
they just don't come up like from nothing. <laughs> they could be a consequence of a model uh, where in linking factors that cause this rare event or something. And then we are interested in, 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 in expressing uncertainty about the parameters involved in this assessment model. Uh, because if, if we were to say, if we were directly to elicit uh, our uncertainty about unique event, not taking anything into consideration, uh, it, it's, a, it's a kind of, um, uh, it, it, I, for me, it sounds like a bit of a hyp hypothetical problem. I, I think, so you agree, Ulrika, that probability uh, theory for things like nuclear power plant safety assessments is sort of BS? <laughs> no, but um, uh, I think that the, these are uh, these are based on uh, on a on a model of the of the components, right, or the events uh, causing a failure. Yeah, but the expert elicitations are not, and the and the datalessness is not. Those are just made uh -huh. up. Yeah, so, and there so that that could be a situation where precise probability may not be a good measure for epistemic uncertainty. Bing, 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 bing. <laughs> that could be a situation, but uh, it's a, uh, and that's a very specific situation because, because we are eliciting the probability of the unique events directly or rare events directly. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the main, one of the big issues that you have when you like, combine different sources of uncertainty to quantify a rare event is that um, very often people make assumptions of independence that may not really be justified. So it's not just only the uncertainty in the probabilities that you can, that you may assign, that you may want to assign. Maybe you can't even do that, but assume you can. There may be some structural uncertainty <clears throat> in the model itself yeah. where you, for convenience, make some independence assumptions. Uh, and uh, as you know, uh, if, if you have a uh, uh, common cause failures or common factors that can cause failures, uh, assuming independence may cause you to underestimate rather than overestimate uh, probabilities of failure, which is a very bad thing. So, yeah, but that's another point, I think, where, where some idea of probability bounding can be quite useful, uh, where you can say, oh, I'm doing this analysis, I have my expert information, but I don't want to make these strong structural assumptions. Um, yeah. I have some uh, questions on the uh, on the chat. Uh, someone asked about uh, what happens if the parameter distribution is not constant but can vary. And if you have if you have a model where your parameter has a distribution, then it's not maybe a parameter because then one can think of it as a variable. So um, it was. Uh, Andy, who asked it? Yeah, I was just thinking more about biological systems that we model. Yeah. Um, I mean, as ever, there's never any empirical data, or it's very rare or limited. But I'm pretty sure those systems aren't constant in all places. All You're kind of assuming that the environment stays the same everywhere, um, or the environment that you're in. And I'm not sure that some of these things in biological systems, they may they may be fairly constant under one set of conditions, but they may look different under another. In terms yeah. of their distribution, you might be right. I, mean, I don't want to get into sort of splitting hairs on whether that's a. No, a but it it, it, it points but, to it points to an important part that that uh, one has to one has to carefully think about how the assessment model is specified. And uh, what is what is express what is expression um, variability or or a random nature of the system and and then parameters that are fixed and then when we are thinking about quantifying uncertainty we can describe uncertainty about these parameters and then propagate through the model. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so it, in, in ecology, where, where I am, and in other fields as well, we have, some, we have a statistical models that includes fixed and random effects, for example. And uh, that is a situation where, where one has a statistical uh, regression analysis, for example. Um, the fixed effects, uh, they are parameters. And then we, we sort of um, 
uh, do the inference, uh, make it drawing conclusions about these parameters. And then the random effects, they are uh, sort of nuisance parameters or, or variation that sort of explain some of the variation obtained in, in our system, but we're not really interested in them per se. And that is a situation where sort of random effects are in, in, in a sense, not parameters, they are variables. Uh, because if, if you look at the structure of the model, they have uh, like usually a zero mean and a, and a certain uh, standard deviation. And then the statistical model is estimating that standard deviation, so which is then the parameter for this random effect. I don't know if any one of you are using this here, but, but that's a situation where, where, where the model itself, depending on how you look at it, you, you sort of have to think, is this, a, is this something that is fixed or is this something that, that varies? And if it varies, I have to impose a structure on that within my assessment model or statistical model. Okay. Um, yeah, so I had a, a question come through uh, directed to Scott. Um, and it's how important are the questions asked from experts to the quality of questions they are providing? Is it in the chat window? Um, what is, I couldn't, you're garbled a little bit. I couldn't quite understand you. Right. Yeah, the question is how important are the questions asked from experts to the quality of questions they are providing? How important are the questions asked of experts? From experts to the quality of questions they are providing. The quality of questions. Uh, I guess I don't understand that question. I can answer it. You should go. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, if we set up uh, expert knowledge solicitation, uh, it is very important on how we specify the questions. So uh, it, it's, it's like almost half the job to, to first get the experts to agree to, to sort of uh, uh, express, in term, express the uncertainty with probability and, uh, and also to sort of uh, see what should we ask about? What questions should we ask and how should we ask the questions to actually get the, the, the best information about uh, uncertainty? And uh, so, for example, uh, in the case I mentioned, if, if we ask them, what do you think is the mean of this uh, parameter? Or if I ask them, uh, could you sort of, um, uh, could you mention a value that you think will, will be uh, exceeded in, in, in half of the times in, in, in your mind about this parameter? It's, a, it's different ways of asking the questions, uh, I would say. And, uh, and one should avoid any things like anchoring or, or, uh, or imposing uh, uh, ideas in the experts and, and, uh, and, uh, and identify if you have a bad, if you don't have well-defined questions, you, 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 the answers you get are not very useful. So the question needs to be very, very clear. And sometimes that is very demanding if we, if we sort of think about what is the definition of that parameter? What do we actually mean by this event and, uh, and that quantity? What, what, are we, what are we actually looking at? And sometimes when we, when we want them to give a good answer, it's, it's very challenging for, for the assessment as a whole because we really have to think uh, uh, strongly about this. Yeah, yeah. I got, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was um, similar question but um, in relating to the importance of questions asked from experts uh, to quality of answers as well. But I imagine it's a similar response. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, see, I see a lot of discussions here. Uh, I think that there are like, uh, uh, Andy, Andy, Andrew Gray, you had a question. You want to have probability intervals. Um, it was just a comment on um, the problem Joshua um, talked about earlier. Well, a possible Bayesian solution to it could be to assume a uniform distribution, but for each probability, right? You don't assume that each of the the probabilities of each of the dice rolls is is one one over six, but that each probability is uniformly distributed, right? And then you can do this. You can calculate this sort of second order distribution you were showing earlier. Without collapsing it to, um, to the predictive distribution, mm -hmm. you still you, you still would propagate the bounds, right? So if you you still get the the interval bounds, but you also get a little bit of the internal structure, right? 
So if you just propagate the bounds, you get something like a, a P box or something like this. But if you propagate the un a uniform distribution, you also get um, sort of how the probability mass is, is distributed within, within those bounds. How would you get any internal structure when the problem it doesn't give you any? Like, I mean, I have, I literally have if six different loaded die. Each of them is loaded to a different number. If, if, you had, if you had a loaded die, you know there are six possible outcomes. And you could just model them each as like a, because th there's a, a probability associated to each outcome of which you're unaware. And then could you not just model mm -hmm. it as like, uh, model a binomial for each possible outcome? binomial distribution and do like the clopper pearson c box sure, and then sure. you would get an interval for each and you could say i want to be 95 percent confident in my intervals develop mm -hmm. an interval for each of the possibilities and then you would get some structure which you can be if you use that structure 95 percent. i mean like applied across six different variables that's maybe more iffy but I think you can use a Dirichlet just to do the joint. Yeah. Yeah, that would work fine. But I'm also a little bit concerned about where the information really comes from. Yeah. So um, if, if, if you say that it's uniform, you kind of, I don't know really if that's appropriate, if you know that the, the, the dice, I mean, if you're going to make any pr predictions based on that, your predictive distribution is still uniform. It is maybe, a, yeah. So maybe bound a bound or a set of Dirichlet might be like yeah. more appropriate for that sort of situation. I don't know. So, so that that, le that leads into bound and probability. We we can discuss that um, in a little while. Uh, I can see that uh, Dimitri has raised his hand. Do you have a question, Dimitri? No, I think we moved on from that. Thank you. Okay, Enrique. No? Okay. Uh, right. Uh, so I, I think that the um, uh, if, if we like, uh, we will come back to this, uh, this die example. Um, uh, and and, and uh, I, I think that the uh, this uh, notion of um, of uh, uniform uh, it's always been problematic when 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 the parameter that you assign uh, the uniform to because it's it's bounded if it's a bounded parameter uh, because you you sort of uh, put a, you put a weight on, on on a scale and it sort of touches the bounds but if you have a if you have a continuous variable uh, which is not bounded uh, and you use very flat priors for that. It's not as problematic uh, as if the, the parameter is bounded. Does anyone have any comment on that? Yeah, that sounds like wishful thinking to me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if I fully agree. It seems more problematic to have a, a like a improper <laughs> prior. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that improper. is very flat. It's, it has to be improper. So at least if it's bounded, you, you, you have a proper distribution. So I always feel a bit uncomfortable using improper priors. Well, I didn't um, mean improper. I, I meant like yeah. a, a very, very flat, but still a right. proper one. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think it's more appropriate if the variable is unbounded? Uh, because it's uh, uh, the, the the mass put on, on on the different values are are having less influence as if if it were if it's bounded you you sort of um, uh, the the edges could be uh, very important um, and the, and the, the probability sure. mass is is sort of uh, as soon as you sure. approaches the edges something happens. Yeah. But, uh, but so some something I find. Uh, Always very. I think it's is it uh, 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 Keynes who gave that example. I mean, if you have uh, sometimes you can phrase your problem and reparameterize it in a nonlinear way, uh, and then you know where do you put your flat prior on exactly. uh, on on the on the parameter or on the inverse of the parameter, and 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 they're not 
they're not they really can lead to different answers so yeah so uh, i think that drives home the point that there's no such thing as an all-informative prior really no and and in um in, in scientific assessments, uh, I would strongly advocate against using uh, what some people would call non-informative priors or flat priors because uh, it is um, uh, this, usually you do scientific assessments uh, to support or, or risk assessments to support important decisions and uh, and if there is if there are things out there that that uh, knowledge that you have. Uh, I think one one should integrate them. And if data is speaking, if, if data is taking over, then that's not a problem. And if data is weak, uh, doesn't have much information for data, you, you have sort of taken that into account. Of course, it could be very resource demanding to get um, inform, uh, informed uh, priors, but uh, I, I think that is the, the way to go. So uh, arguments, Arguments that that we have a problem when when priors have an influence uh, doesn't uh, I'm not bothered by them at all because I think the priors should be allowed to have an influence if 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 data is weak. Yeah, but you're cheating. As if that's the answer to your question. Am I cheating? In what you're way? Cheating. You're cheating if you if that's your answer to the question of what how can I get a, a non-informative prior? Because there are situations where non-informative priors are are useful, and to say that. Oh no, they're never useful. That's not that's cheating. Tell us what you really think. And, and it's not the case. <laughs> not, not is right. It is simply not the case that there's such a thing as a non-informative prior. They're all informative. And if you make them flat, you've informed them by that flatness. That's just all there is to it. So when Dimitri says, Dimitro says, you know, there's no true probability, I think my reflexive answer has got to be there's no non-informative prior. So there. Um, how do you proceed in a scientific manner when you haven't studied this problem before uh, and, and you really genuinely don't have an idea of what it should be, but you have to have some prior? You're, you're in this quandary, but, right? When, yeah. when, Mars, when NASA has to send a probe to Mars and they have to say something about Martian weather, they've never been to Mars. They don't have knowledge about what Martian weather is, but they have to make some prognostication about it. What are they supposed to do? Yeah. So that is that is a that is an assessment where where your knowledge is like you know from the beginning that that we have we have very bad knowledge about this. Uh, I would say that 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 could be a situation where one may consider uh, that that uh, precise probability may not be enough to to describe epistemic uncertainty. But in many many cases, like in medicine. Uh, when we do risk assessments, uh, like in chemicals and, and so on, uh, we are not starting from scratch. There well, is a lot of information out there to use. And, uh, but that doesn't um, use all that information because some of it's inappropriate to use, right? So if we're using, for instance, the prior, it, it, let's, say, let's say we're working on a, a new drug that's going to be a generic replacement for Viagra. Yep. And we, use the data from Viagra as the priors, right? We could do that, but that would kind of be inappropriate because if we had no data at all, we'd just get the Viagra answers back and then we would be tricking ourselves into thinking it's somehow a bioequivalent when it might not be at all. Well, I think that the drug companies would, uh, would, would make some uh, mechanistic modeling or right. or or some uh, they do. they're frequentists they don't use this bayesian idea that's crazy uh well maybe you should look at the successful drug companies and see what they're using well they use bioequivalence models and those are not bayesian at all old-fashioned frequentist stuff i, I think it, is it a question of it comes back to like, it feels like you could try and quantify this epistemic uncertainty in this way, but it feels like out the other end, you get something that it feels more natural to call a belief than a probability. And it's like fundamentally, what difference does that distinction make in the way you would use these models? Because it feels like, pro like probabilities need to, need to have some kind of, like I don't know the way I the way 
I, I feel about it in, in in my head. It feels like probabilities are some kind of grounded, like you can show some, if you have a stationary distribution, you can show some kind of like grounded, like true probability in that. But going forward, it's like, it's difficult to assign probabilities, but you can assign beliefs. But mechanically, there is a distinction between beliefs and probabilities. And how do you compensate for that when applying a Bayesian framework? Maybe what you're saying, Alex, is that probability may be the, the, the science of beliefs if Bayesians have their way and they steal the word probability from the rest of the world. But science still needs some sort of science of uncertainty, some sort of science of frequencies, perhaps, some sort of science of what's not purely subjective belief, but something that's demonstrable, something that's objectively mm. recoverable, something that, you know, science should be based on. To kind I of along, don't agree. I, I almost feel like if if I if I consider some like as you add more data, as I go to the infinite uh, of a belief, it becomes a probability. Yeah. And so we often represent beliefs using the same language of probability, but it's not a true probability. But if we were to get the complete data, that belief collapses to a probability, like we can get that with something simple like rolling a die. So there, we're not dealing with beliefs, we're dealing with probability versus who's going to win the baseball game. There, we are dealing with beliefs, not probability, because we, we can't get to know that. And so to me, it would be helpful to have some type of mathematical structure that for that same given information, you can say, okay, here's your belief. It's some maybe very detailed distribution, but if you also... But in, in reality, if we're going to express it with just what we know about it, you're still going to have to be using maybe just these bounds, or, or maybe we haven't been able to update bounds or anything like that. And that's why I think it, it takes, there's, it seems like there's other t concepts and terminology that need to be added to the field, because to me, you want to be able to represent your belief about something, which is as well developed, but you know you're not sure, versus also representing, okay, well, you have to bet the entire world's population on this one bet. What do we really know? Well, the only thing we can really say is the values between one and six. And Which is not very helpful. Well, it, it, in some cases it isn't. In other cases it is. Yeah. But if, if, if you're, it's, and like, how do you separate beliefs and show that one belief is better than another in, the, in that same line? I mean, I think that would I, be helpful. Yeah. The, uh, it, it's a, one has to sort of argue and, and, and sort of uh, use uh, scientific sound approaches to, to, to sort of do the assessment and, um, and be very transparent about how it's done and be able to show data out of the sleeve to, to sort of show exactly what has been done. I mean, it's, uh, I think that, the, that the, Using sound approaches and transparency is how we how we argue that this is a trustworthy output. Uh, and of course, that we have uh, systematically searched for for um, the available evidence that exists. Uh, that's actually very interesting, uh, Urka. So, and and it is does and it really does encapsulate the Bayesian approach, I think, quite well. So their argument is that they will use sound methods to make these calculations and inferences, which is completely different from what science normally says. Science normally says we're going to base our calculations and inferences on data, and we will check in validations whether or not those data have led to good predictions or not, right? But that is the difference between Bayesian calculations and, and you know, the rest of science, I think. And not that it's not that I'm saying that it's necessarily bad. I, I think it's fine for, for personal beliefs. It seems quite reasonable a thing to do. Uh, but note that it is quite different from what we used to call science and engineering. Well, for, there, there is this um, issue that uh, uh, if you look at if you look at the big picture of science, where you sort of formulate the hypothesis and you may reject them or, or so on, one can think of it as a sequential updating in, in a loose end uh, and it's also that uh, to, um, um, 
that 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 we are specifying a model and then at, the, at some point we reject it we come up with another alternative it doesn't really match with with the bayesian approach where we sort of assume that our model is true and that's the only one but but we uh, but what one can say is that 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 uh, uh, when i when i specify a model i am prepared to sort of reflect whether this is an appropriate model or not based on uh, based on, on on how I, s I look at its performance uh, when I validate it, um, but but the biggest issue here is that uh, Bayesian methods are being used in science. They are more and more accepted as valid approaches in science. Um, if you look in um, molecular biology, uh, they could be very complex problems with uh, which you can't solve with uh, classical statistics. And uh, also, for example, if in the field where I am in environmental science and ecology, there's a lot of researchers using Bayesian inference uh, to produce their scientific papers. So uh, it is, it, there is a shift uh, where, where the frequentist uh, and the Bayesian methods exist side by side in science. And uh, one should use them for, for, for the purpose uh, where, where they are useful. And, uh, if the focus is on estimation or making predictions or predictive uh, sciences, then, then Bayesian methods uh, may be uh, uh, over, they are uh, more uh, high performance than frequentist methods. But if you're only just, if you're testing interested in hypothesis testing using p-value approaches and so on, then frequentist methods may be okay. <laughs> but I would say that Bayesian methods are, are, are a valid part of science, yes. Yeah, so one of the, one of the, if I may interject, one of the issues I have with a lot of the Bayesian analysis you see in the kind of, uh, in, in, applied, in applied, applied sciences is that very often you have like nice models, nice analysis, nice computational stuff and, and you know, it's all beautiful, but then if you look carefully and uh, at the assignment of the prior distributions, then it's very hand wavy. Yeah. Uh, if, even when informative priors are used, it's, it's often very little discussed i mean and that yeah. should be really be that's one of the main points of 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 uh of uh, the science right is where do the prior distribution what's what how did i come up with that and that and is very uh, often yeah yeah so that has yeah. been overlooked i think they've been trying yeah. to hide that in in the closet that the, the, right. the we don't want the price to matter we want it to sort of be objective and uh, but but the, yeah. the use of, of informative priors are, uh, are are becoming more and more. Um, there is a need for methods to, to work with that, and I think it's coming, yeah. but it's not there yet. Uh, if I may, I had a question for Alex actually, and, yeah. and maybe also for Joshua, yeah. because you, you were talking about when you're talking about probability. Um, mm. um, do you do you do you understand necessarily probability as frequency? Because you keep say keep, keep making this distinction between probability and belief uh, and, and for me these are kind of you know probability is an expression of belief for me from where I come from from my background uh, and I don't I'm not necessarily married for that to be a frequency but from what you're saying I'm kind of getting that sense is that is that correct or not and, and why, where does that come from? Yeah, I, th I think I, I'd describe my understanding of probabilities as like frequency based. Right. And I, I, th I think my, my concern is trying to, because I understand the I understand the the utility of belief, um, like as as a concept in the Bayesian approach. I f I feel generates beliefs that, as Joshua said, could converge to probabilities when they have the data that supports a frequentist sort of understanding of it right. uh, i think like my, right. my, my interest in like but but can i object to that because a parameter doesn't turn into a variable because you have a lot of data so so when i when i think about the we have certain things that we're uncertain about and that uncertainty won't turn into um a relative frequency uh, it's just that our uncertainty is is, is being uh, reduced to very a very right. narrow uh, so distribution. Exactly. That, that makes it a constant, not a variable. But a giant amount of uncertainty will uncover the constant value. Yeah, of course. But it's uh, then it's not then then the the probability is like 
it doesn't turn into a probability or like a relative frequency it turns into no, it's, a single number it's a well it's a Dirac distribution then if you will yeah you're f yeah <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's, I, it's it's still technically like in the way I've said it, it. Yeah, you would still it would still technically be a belief, but there is a point at which yeah, it would effectively turn into a, a Dirac delta, and you can treat it as a single value. And at that yeah. point, it, it, you could right. consider it a probability. I, I like the very formal definition of probability in terms of probability measure, because what I found is when I'm thinking about all of these terminologies, I'm realizing that I'm using the word probability in senses that's not true. I mean, you need a state space, you need to define uh, a single value for each of those things in the state space that maps it so that the sum of those is equal to one. And I like that probability measure because then I realize like, for example, if I roll a die, like, again, I like die just because it's the most, the best random variable generator I have. And I don't know its probability distribution um, whether it's fair, I mean, it, it doesn't matter if it's uniform, ununiform, whatever it is. Um, I can roll the die and I can, as I add more data, I can narrow in the probability of getting any particular face of the die. And when I have no rolls, the probability of rolling a six is somewhere between zero and one and five, zero and one and so on and so forth. After five rolls, I can come up with a way to shrink those bounds and then after an infinite number of rolls, I've shrunken all the bounds to, I know exactly what the probability of rolling a one is, a two is a three is a four is a five is a six. And so I've gone from where I didn't have the probability of the distribution of the die to now knowing the probability of the distribution of the die and the probability of any specific face has gone from a broad spectrum, which maybe was represented as a distribution or maybe as an interval to yeah. a single value. Yeah, exactly. So, I, I think we, we sort of agree on that, uh, but, but what, what I had a comment on was that, that I, don't, I don't really see how, how a, a deg um, like changing that I have a degree, of, I have a subjective probability about something and uh, I can't really see the transition from that to a, a relative frequency because that's a, another part of my model. So throwing the die is outcome of a random event, and then I can be uncertain about the uh, characteristics of this random event. But when I, when I, when I reduce my uncertainty, I'm only getting a better idea of how the random event looks like. It's not. Uh, but if I only think of this as rolling it once, with no repetitive sampling possibilities, then I could think of the the di probability distribution for the outcome of the die with one throw only. That could be a sign of subject probability, uh, if, if, if that's the, my model. Um, so, right. Laura, can I ask a question? Yeah, please do. Maybe, maybe redirect a bit. I, I'm kind of surprised that this discussion has been so much about Bayesianism, because that really wasn't the design, was it? I mean, we were talking about, I thought, the comparison between precise and imprecise yeah that's my second part i have uh, some more slides to show <laughs> well but but let's then address the the one question that you did clearly ask which was about the next value distribution um the what well about the the distribution of the next sample value the predictive, predictive yeah the predictive distribution sorry um so so you're not happy with the predictive distribution and you would prefer it to be a meta distribution. Is that is that your idea? Uh, define meta distribution. Uh, well, a, a distribution of distributions. Well, I would keep the hierarchical uh, distinction, yes. So um, I would sort of uh, keep the, allow myself to be able to Propagate uncertainty in the parameters to whatever I'm interested in. So if I if I if I collapse if I take the margin on on, on a variable on a observable, then uh, then I'm collapsing uh, the uh, the uh, joint probability distribution which the Bayesian model is the joint probability distribution over variables and parameters. I'm collapsing collapsing it into variables. Then I don't have any any idea of how much is epistemic and how much is uh, a letter uncertainty in this uh, uh, predicted distribution that I have. Okay, so that was a very elaborate way to say yes. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, I know that um, Ender thinks that too. Maybe Ender's not. No, Ender's maybe not. So I would like you guys to justify why a meta distribution is the right characterization for the uncertainty about the outcome. Because I, I've tried to suggest this to Bayesian and they get really mad and their faces get red and they start to look for weapons. Um, so I'm just warning you that it's going to meet a lot of resistance. Um, and I would like to hear your arguments about why this is a reasonable thing. Why the, I mean, you might start out by saying that the predictive distribution doesn't have the hypothesized distribution, right? So if you say that this is the distribution of the next variable to be a but the, the, the next, the value of the next variable is not what I'm interested in. If I'm interested in that, that would be another story, but I'm not interested in that. I'm inter in, interested in how often the variable uh, exceeds a certain number. That is what I'm interested in. Right. And if I would go via, uh, if I would arrive this uh, by they, they producing a, a predictive distribution, I don't propagate uncertainty to the quantity that I'm interested in. And that's all you have to say, is that? Yeah. The and ever, does everybody agree? My comment on this is that, well, the, the meta distribution allows you to separate aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty, right? So if, if the parameter distribution is bounded, then it's a kind of a similar structure to a P-box. You still get the bounds, but you also get a sort of an internal structure to it. Mm. Great. I'd, I'd say, like, if, if the... It comes down to a question of like if the dependence on the probability within that like zero one interval that you're assigning, um, if it's like monotonic across that, then you could just do the endpoint propagation, and then you've got the endpoints in the second order distribution that you're getting out. Maybe but then, if if it's if it starts being being the case that because of the different parameters that you're propagating through that you don't have that endpoint. Um, the endpoints don't actually propagate through to give you the true outputs. It becomes difficult then saying, well, try a trying to find just the endpoints, but B trying to assign densities across that space feels like it's not necessarily I mean, like, I, I may be wrong, but it feels like that's not necessarily a rigorous way to try and, encapt to try and capture that uncertainty. Well, I, I think that um, I, I would just like to, because I don't think, I don't know if everyone is, is uh, familiar to, to what, uh, what the discussion is leading into. So if, if I may just uh, continue a little while um, uh, with this discussion. Uh, with this presentation that I prepared. Is that okay? Yeah. 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 yeah so the question was whether uh, bounded probability is a useful alternative and uh, as a complement or as an alternative. That's the question. Uh, so I am, um, as we said, we have some caveats and uh, I just put, put some of them up now here that if we have uh, weak knowledge and weak data, it's not e even ideal for a an assessment in the first place. We have very low confidence in uncertainty and, uh, and uh, if we use like flat powers, like everything is just very flat and, and we don't really know what's going on. And then uh, coming up with very precise claims about uncertainty could, could sort of uh, be a bit cheating a bit about our uncertainty that exists. Um, and uh, we could also have the problem where we have very strong uh, expert uh, information, uh, which is in conflict with data, and uh, which, which, uh, which results in inference that tends up to be somewhere in the middle, which may be, be sort of in a sense wrong for both them. Uh, and we don't really see this type of conflicts when we, uh, when we perform an inference with precise probability. Uh, it can be really difficult to detect if the model is quite complex. Uh, and then we also have the issue that uh, uh, 
people, experts, can actually find it difficult to, to make precise probability statements. So with that in mind, uh, we can think uh, what would be, uh, what, what if we are uncertain about our subjective probability? Uh, could we then sort of think about expressing this uncertainty in, in some way? Still keeping in the use of probability as expressions for epistemic uncertainty. I mean, there are other expressions of epistemic uncertainty, but I stick to using probabilities here. Um, so what one can think of is that one can sort of uh, put uncertainty on the hyperparameters, uh, for example, uh, or, or in another terminology, use higher order probabilities. Uh, so here is just some extraction for some philosophical discussions uh, that the uh, uh, that the philosophers may think that it's meaningless uh, if we put probabilities on our subject probabilities then we could put probabilities on that and so on and when should we stop i mean uh, there is no end to it and uh, one can also think about that uh, uh, if we sort of start adding layers of uh, probability or higher order probabilities at the end, we have to sort of, we basically want to collapse it down to some kind of weighted average uh, down to the first level, to the subjective probability that this sort of captures the uncertainty we have. Um, and uh, then one could sort of uh, uh, say that uh, but this first, this weighted average does not really, it loses information about how confident we are in, in, in the assessment. So one can think of argue that we should have a distinction between, uh, we should have a level like the first order, uh, subjective probability is sort of basis for action. Whereas the second, uh, the second order probability is a basis for our trust in the assessment as such, uh, which we could sort of, in this case, calling it the epistemic probability or a degree of confidence uh, about the assessment. And so on. there are, of course, other people that have said things here. Uh, so an alternative to precise probability is, as someone mentioned here, that we could put an interval on, on our parameters. Um, so to the right, I have an example here where, where we put an interval on, on the mean, for example, the mu, and we, we made a lower and upper bound on that. Uh, so what I would call the, what the resulting feature that would come out of this is what I would call a, a, an aleatory P-box. Uh, so uh, epistemic uncertainty is not, not longer described by uh, probabilities, it's described by intervals. Uh, and uh, the intervals come from, from experts. I mean, they can look at data and so on, but they have to sort of physically assign it by experts. Um, and it's, it may not be that clear how to actually combine uh, parameters if you have several parameters attached to each variable. On the other hand, this produces features that are very quick uh, to propagate, and it may be sufficient for the uh, assessment that's been going on. I'm uh, teasing uh, Scott a bit here. Um, Another alternative is to stick with probabilities as a characterization of epistemic uncertainty, but bound them. And what we would get then is what I would call an epistemic P-box. And I put P-box in quotation because we're not really do, uh, deriving these P-boxes. Uh, so for example, let's say that I have my model again for, for my parameter again. I'm talking about epistemic uncertainty here. Uh, and then I sort of have my, my hyperparameters and I say that th they belong to a set. Uh, so I have several possible uh, versions of this probability distribution for my, my uh, uncertainty about the mu. And if we do this, uh, we can sort of, uh, like this is one example of how to work with this. We can sort of uh, think of this that we, we still use Bayesian inference to update, but we update under this set of priors. And uh, if, we, if, we, if we do this, it's, it could be really useful for, for scientific assessment in general, because we can actually combine the framework with, with the uh, uncertainty quantified by precise probability. It's just a special case of this. And, uh, and, uh, and we don't have to sort of construct these epistemic P-boxes on all the parameters, because it's really challenging to propagate it through and then derive quantum of interest. So instead it turns into a, an optimization problem of deriving bounds, representing our uncertainty in the quantum interested under these sets of priors uh, using um, Bayesian inference. And uh, me and Matthias, we call this uh, robust Bayesian inference. It's not, it's like coming from 
from the notion where you sort of test whether your choice of prior has an influence, but the difference is that we keep the priors, we keep the set and we just do an inference under that set. Uh, so if we would uh, uh, look at this as a way to sort of uh, propagate uncertainty, um, we would uh, we could sort of um, update uh, and propagate uh, it through our model using iterative importance sampling, where we sample from the hyperparameters in the set, and then we sort of see search for the bounds, and then we go back and forward and try to find the, the choices of hyperparameters that would correspond to the bound or the quantity of representing a certain quantum interest. And this works very well when we have conjugate models. Um, and uh, and uh, I know that there are plenty of projects working on, on, on how to sort of do this when we have to rely on MCMC sampling. Uh, so, so sort of to summarize then that the, this, this use of bounded probabilities to represent epistemic uncertainty it could be seen as epistemic p-boxes, but I argue that we are not really using uh, p-boxes as structures as such. It turns into optimization problems, and this could look really, really messy. And I also have some slides showing that how one possibly could elicit bounded probabilities. Uh, so in a case where we asked about the precise probability, we got this and we got a very nice prior. If we get bounded probability, we get some kind of, uh, we only have uh, extractions of, of where the CDF could lie. And then, uh, uh, and then we basically define conditions uh, for the sets of priors that agree with these bounded probabilities that have been elicited. And then we can sort of think of all po many different possible uh, priors course, agreeing to these conditions. And then we search for the, the choice that, that sort of result in, in the bounded uh, outcomes of, of the uncertainty and the quantitative interest. Uh, and then I also gonna say something about confidence theory, but I know that there are people who are more uh, better in, than me in this, but basically confidence uh, structures um, uh, have would be maybe another way to sort of get bound some probabilities, uh, but they are going in a in a different route. So uh, you don't really use. In a sense, it could look uh, look like uh, this robust Bayesian inference uh, where you have non-informative priors, but uh, it's um, it's a prior. It should not use any expert information, no priors, and instead one is searching for. Uh, confidence structures uh, on, on parameters uh, that contest a certain coverage properties and it's it, it's uh, it needs data to to work and in some way or i guess one has to sort of how to propagate it from the parameters to the quantum interest is it's um, without collapsing epistemic and uncertainty uh, is, a, is a question that that uh, i have so so the alternatives that, that I talk about here is, uh, is then to use um, uh, uh, a possibility extension to get bounded probabilities to consider some of these uh, uh, issues with precise probability is to sort of uh, do Bayesian inference on the sets of priors. Uh, uh, and, it, and then one has all the features that comes with a Bayesian approach uh, to quantum uncertainty but one can take into account uh, the fact that it could be difficult and challenging to specify precise probabilities. And it sort of results in, in uh, bounded probabilities, which could be seen as imprecise probabilities. So this was uh, leading into to the next part of the discussion where we, we can sort of discuss uh, whether bounded probability would be a possible alternative or complement to precise probability. Um, yeah, so I open up the floor again. if there are people left. Well, if no one says anything, then I'll probably give like a very small remark. Uh, definitely it is a alternative for sure, because like, like, um, like if let's say, you know, you have no idea as to what the values can take and definite interval uh, probabilities would be the, the best approach to quantify your, your knowledge. Um, however, the only thing we had to take note of is that the, um, and correct me, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, for those who are well-versed than, than me in this, um, concept of interval probabilities, but it what the interval probabilities will not be able to tell us the let's say you know the the, 
the homogeneity in the distribution of the of the values between these intervals. So in the Bayesian approach, we had the posterior. You, 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 will, you will probably give you the idea of like how the things are distributed between within a certain bound, whereas the interval will not tell you that, uh, except except for the extreme bounds of the two values. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm making sense over here, or um, if, if my words do mean anything. Yeah. Uh, Scott, do you have a comment on that? Oh yeah, uh, Professor Scott, maybe you can. I, I think, uh, I mean, I, I approve of what Adolphus has said, even if I don't approve of what Ulrich has said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't quite understand. I think Adolphus, everything you said was sure, absolutely. Um, but Ulrich, I'm confused about, you sort of suggested that there were two kinds of these structures, one, an epistemic one and an aleatory one. Are they somehow importantly different? Yeah. And, and what's the difference? Okay, so... Uh, is only one of them used in robust Bayesian analysis? Uh, are you talking about the Aleatory and epistemic P-box? Yeah. Yeah, so Aleatory P-box is not using Bayesian. It's not using the subject probability to, to describe uncertainty because the parameters are described by intervals. Oh, so I see. So for you, Bayesian means subjective, is that right? Bayesian means that we're using probabilities to describe epistemic uncertainty. Mm. Bayesian means we're using probability distributions, presumably. Actually, I'll rather correct that. It's more like using probabilistic models and tools to quantify the uncertainty, rather than just the probability in general. It could be that the aleatory P-box is a special case of, uh, of robust Bayesian inference where, where, the, um, uh, where the intervals are actual intervals coming from um, imprecise probability. But in general, these, these parameters, uh, they're continuous. The parameters of the variables, uh, they're continuous and uh, uh, putting an interval on a continuous par parameter means that you're basically leaving out the possibility that it, the actual value would be outside. That is the point of knowledge. Yeah. And uh, no, then, allowed. The, then, then one could say that using, a, using a epistemic P-boxes on parameters doesn't have that feature because you're putting bounds on the probabilities expressing uncertainty about parameters. You're not putting bounds on the parameters per se. I see. So they're uh, sort of a, they're only on hyperparameters or something. Yeah. That's yeah. The bounds the bounds are put on on. I can I can think of it as if the bounds are put on hyperparameters, but it doesn't have to be that either. Because in the case where I got my uh, bounded uh, probabilities from the experts, I have bounds on the probabilities uh, that represents the um, uh, CDF for, uh, for the parameter. And from that, I can derive hyperparameters corresponding to the distribution that I have signed up for, for, the, for the parameter in question. But I don't automatically have bounds on the hyperparameter either. So there is a, um, uh, using this approach, one can think about uh, maybe it would have been easier if I asked the expert to give me just a bound on the, param on the hyperparameter directly, but I consider that a very sort of artificial question to ask, to, give, ask, yeah. to ask them to give me a bound on a hyperparameter, especially if it's a variance uh, or parameter. Mm -hmm. Instead, I would ask them to bound uh, a, uh, to a CDF in some way. Well, the information that we have comes from a whole variety of sources. Experts are only just one kind of information. Um, I'm a little confused because you, you seem to wrangle these objects in a very you know, idiosyncratic way. I'm not sure why you made these rules up. But, um, I, I don't want to impede the discussion. I think we should. Other people. Yeah, have I, 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 I do have a, like a, a view, I guess. Um, so w one of the, I think, I mean, one of the reasons that Urika stated, of course, is because of the, the, the bounds. You have to set hard bounds on the interval on the parameter with the, with the epistemic P box between quotes. 
uh, you don't quite have to do that. But I think there is another benefit, um, and that is um, with the between quotes epistemic p box. Um, you can um, you can use Bayes rule to do the updating on all the distributions, and you can't do that if you just have an interval. Because if you just have an interval, you do, you you could like see that as a set of all distributions of, on that support. But if you do the Bayesian update on that, you get exactly the same thing back, because all the extreme distributions are in there and they will not move away no matter what the data says. Uh, so if you want to interpret uh, like a classical p-box in, in a Bayesian way, suppose you would want to do that, you can't really do the updating on it. Is, is, that, is, that, is that correct? Yeah, so, yeah, so I, 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 if, if you look uh, explicitly at the, at the, at the a letter p-box, uh, which means that you have a variable, a PDF for a variable, and then you have intervals and the parameters, uh, there is, to my knowledge, um, I don't have any clear understanding of how this would be updated in light of data, but uh, the Wally method—it's all possible combinations, and you update them uh, in that way. I, I don't understand what the problem is. Of course, you can update them. Using what? The the robust phase works just fine for them as well. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I'm not sure whether the robust base would end up having an interval still. So but, I'm sorry, it only works, by the way, if you assume n normality or, or something. No, it's, in there. It doesn't, yeah, OK. It doesn't work for three P-boxes, obviously, because yeah. in that case, yeah, well, yeah. you still do yeah. base. So the, I mean, yeah. there could be special cases where, where it gives back the same feature. But uh, in other cases, it, one would end up having a distribution uh, like an epistemic p-box for the parameters still. No, 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 no. It works. No? It works fine. Always. <laughs> no, 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 no. What are you talking about? Uh, so, so, so the reason I'm putting this uh, here is that uh, that uh, I think. I think that the p boxes, uh, the, the use of aleatory p boxes are very useful, but when it comes at, at using them as structures for uncertainty, we have some limitations um, because we lose this uh, ability to sort of integrate uh, information uh, sources uh, into them. And, uh, and if, we, if we sort of instead think about that we have uh, uh, epistemic uncertainty, Expressed in terms of bounded probability, uh, we are we are we are doing we are doing the same thing, but we we are keeping a, a slightly bit more complex structure for for the, our description of the uncertainty about parameters, and that allows us to sort of use the Bayesian machinery still, but under sets of price instead. I, th I think maybe Scott was meaning the same thing because there's there's two there's there's the free p boxes and there's the kind of the parametric p boxes right, so maybe we're talking about the same thing, but not realizing it. Maybe, I, I have no idea what the what the two kinds of p boxes are. So maybe you could. Well, the the c the c box I have tried uh, so the c box come from the application of uh, confidence theory. It's a confidence structure. Uh, and 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 you have you have sort of presented it either as quick base or confidence structure and uh, and yeah. uh, and when I as I, the way I understand the the quick base is that it's it's a robust Bayesian inference with non-informative priors uh, or default priors um, uh, and then one has uh, basically intervals on on the uh, on, on some of the hyperparameters in these default priors is that correct? No, uh, okay. it, it's it's Bayesian inference without priors, I guess you would say, um, because we're not specifically making a prior, uh, an assumption about priors. Yeah, so it's the, uh, it's, the um, it's the confidence intervals for the parameters that are uh, turned into um, as a, a p box. No, no, not confidence intervals. No, they're confidence structures, which means the confidence intervals at all levels. Yeah. Simultaneously. Yeah. But that's a discussion for Michael to talk about. Um, 
So you are saying you are saying that the that the C boxes is not a result of, of uh, uh, it's not uh, linked to robust patient inference. Did, did you want me to jump in? Sure, please, please. Um, yeah. So um, uh, first, before before I say this first part, I, I want to say, Scott, I really admire the way you've handled this conversation so far. Um, <laughs> um, I'm but, sorry. I was embarrassed by my behavior. I was getting a little. Oh. Um, but but before uh, that's the butter up, which is so here comes part two, which is you should have <laughs> never called you should have never called this quick base, and I feel like I've said that at the time um, because yeah, there there's nothing Bayesian about it. You can <laughs> some <laughs> you model averaging either. Hmm? There's nothing Bayesian about Bayesian model averaging either. We're just we're it's a it's a it's a complete. Uh, branding exercise yes yes it is and i'm you know as a socialist well, I, I don't, don't believe in branding exercises <laughs> <laughs> um but i i would say um you can sometimes get a confidence distribution uh using a um did, did i hear someone in the background or no that was just background noise Oh, okay, cool. Um, so you can sometimes get a confidence distribution using a particular type of non Bayesian inference with a particular type of non informative prior. Um, that's true, but yeah, uh, that, that's it. There's, um, that's kind of coincidental because, you know, likelihood is very powerful. <laughs> um, uh, it's not really. Um, yeah, the the whole quick base thing, as Scott said, just a branding exercise, which with which I had no participation. <laughs> but then I then I suggest to not call it quick base. Yeah, that was my future. suggestion too. <laughs> no, 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 that's we need to do that because otherwise they won't fund us. Um. Yeah, that's I'm already unfunded, so that's a you problem. <laughs> but uh, but you have to agree that uh, the comf uh, confidence structures of C boxes are uh, you need data in order to to uh, yes that's correct derive them yes and yes. Uh, uh, if you would if you would construct a C box for a parameter can you construct it for more than one parameter at a time. And my second question is, how do you propagate that to a possible quantity of interest, or are you only interested in the parameters? So, um, do, do you want me to stay in, Scott? Do you want me to answer yeah. that? Please, please. Okay, cool. So, um, mean and standard deviation. <laughs> so, can you repeat the question real quick? Okay, the first question was, um, how do you how do you construct confidence uh, or C boxes for more than one parameter at a time? Mm -hmm. um, and that, I mean, methods vary. I mean, the whole it's kind of funny for me to answer these questions just because I've moved on from any kind of C box and. Uh, oh, you're not using it. Okay. Consonant confidence structures. So yeah. certainly the answer with consonant confidence structures, there was a whole presentation on how you could do that numerically. Uh, that was my first presentation. Um, and the other way, the direct way, is to kind of pick a good test statistic. Uh, but you have to understand that what you're going to get out of that is going to be a consonant structure, a possibilistic structure. Yeah, uh, that does have the side effect of automatically, um, kind of, kind of almost automatically keeping aleatory and epistemic uh, uncertainty separate. Um, it doesn't uh, possibilistic structure doesn't fold into your random variables to then give you a predictive structure. No, um, it, it you know it will naturally just give you the kind of nested structure. I think you've been implicitly talking about. It will naturally force you to keep a second order structure, a meta distribution as Scott calls them. Um, but what if, but like, uh, if you, how would, could you construct a constant structure for, uh, for the, the probability that uh, a variable would exceed a, a certain value? Uh, yeah. And um, so first you, the consonant structure would be on the parameters of that distribution. And then if you propagated it forward, you would get a consonant structure on the probability of exceeding that certain value. 
and then, well, yeah, no, there's no and then for that. That's, um, so you basically, each parameter value for, so say you've got a normal with unknown mean and standard deviation, you get some samples for that normal distribution. And you're interested in the probability, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you're asking me is, can I get a structure on the probability of that normal distribution or a sample from that normal distribution exceeding some threshold? That, that's what you're asking, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so then each value of the mean and standard deviation will map to a particular value of the probability of exceeding some, you know, whatever threshold you chose. So the propagating that would be pretty simple. So for the constant and confidence structure on mean and standard deviation, you've got a pointwise plausibility value for each possible value of mean and standard deviation. And you just shove those forward onto, or map those forward, I should say properly, um, onto the probability of exceeding a uh, exceeding that threshold. And what you'll get, because we're talking about uncertainty in two parameters, is you'll get one of those hazy structures in my uh, first presentation yeah. in this series. Yeah. 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 And then you just draw a line on top of that uh, hazy structure, and ta-da! You've got a consonant confidence structure for the probability of exceeding some threshold. Yeah. But so basically, basically the uh, it, it's like it's like the confidence uh, consonant uh, structure is is creating bounds on the parameters, and then you you do forward uh, propagation of that. Yeah, but bounds at multiple certainty levels. But yeah. Yeah, but are you are you having any any uh, first uh, or higher order? Uh, uncertainties within these confidence structures. Uh, I'll need a clear definition of what you mean by that. Okay. Uh, is, that's what they represent. They represent that higher order uncertainty. They, they represent uncertainty, right? Yeah, they're so, representing uncertainty in the fixed parameters, right. in the fixed but unknown parameters. Yeah. But I mean, let, let's say that, uh, so how can you tell whether, let, let's say that you would have a, you would have an uncertainty that is a subject for action, for example, and then you would have a feature of this, which is telling you whether you, you sort of, about your confidence in the assessment as such. Uh, so if, if I would use uh, this robust Bayesian framework, I could say that if the, if the difference between the bounds are very small, then I have high confidence in, in my assessment. The, if the difference between the bounds are very large, then, then I have less confidence in the assessment. And that would be yeah, then a second the order thing. characterization of the epistemic uncertainty. But, but do con, uh, confidence, consonant structures have the same division? If you're, u if, they're, if you're using them, yeah, yes. The answer is yes. Okay. It's basically, it's the same kind of, it's the same, Oh, it, at a high level, it's the same kind of architecture you're talking about. It, we're just using a different mathematical framework for representing uncertainty in the parameters. But it's still going to be, you're still going to have that segregation between alien for an epistemic uncertainty. Yeah. And you'll still, um, you'll still see, you know, oh, if I've got more uncertainty in my parameters, I get more uncertainty in my, you know, my probabilities out the other end. Um, you yeah, still and, get that. yeah it's, and I think it's it's uh, some way it's, it would be very rewarding to, to sort of uh, use one measure for aleatory and another one for epistemic and in the in the in the Bayesian approach uh, uh, we use basically probability for both which can mm -hmm. be very confusing but uh, I, I would argue that it still it, it it still works. It's a working machinery, except that in some situations it may uh, you may have uh, problems keeping track of uh, uh, how uh, like you can't say how how confident your your assigned probabilities are if you want to do that. Well, um, and, so and, uh, <laughs> I don't know that it does work. It seems to me it has some pretty clear failures. It works uh, well. Uh, I mean, there is a trade-off. Uh, I, I, can, I can tell you that Bay, you, can, you can quantify uncertainty on many, many problems, all 
statistical models and and you can sort of you can do it the question is whether you want to do it that's another one uh, and i can sort of uh, if i if i have data sets where i have measurements of many many variables at the same time i can sort of make inference on that and capture dependencies between variables and parameters and so on so uh, it, it sort of allows me for it's a very flexible way to sort of learn from from data and integrate <laughs> evidence. Um, so, so let me jump in, and which, I, I'm which I say think that some some of these confidence structures they are uh, like uh, what I've seen is like one variable, a uh, few set of parameters at a time, and then you combine things. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, in the presentation that I did a week, so so just to that last comment, you're right. Uh, the presentation I did was showing let's do one at a time and then combine them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. That's not the only way to do it, though. But, but what's wrong? For example, wrong with you can do all your um, variables at once using a direct derivation, say using say something universal or almost universal like relative likelihood as a test statistic. But um, I, I'd, I'd like to jump in and say the thing I'd kind of been thinking for a while <laughs> while we were having the bigger discussion about Bayesian inference or while you guys were, um, which is, yes, it is a very flexible framework that you can apply everywhere. Like you can execute the mathematics on it, but that doesn't mean the mathematics are appropriate. Um, for example, I, here's an analogy that will probably make sense only to me, but I'm going to make it anyway, which is, you know, I can execute, you know, I, I come from an aerodynamics background and I can execute the mathematics on incompressible in viscid flow everywhere. Every problem I can execute those mathematics is very simple mathematics, very straightforward. I can crunch it through. But if I try to apply that to a re-entry flow, you know, to get peak heating, you know, at Mach 25, and I assume an incompressible and viscid flow, I can get a very easy answer, but the, that answer will be very wrong compared to the underlying reality of the problem. Um, so, and if I want to apply a methodology that will get me a right answer, you know, a correct, a physically correct answer for that problem, it's very difficult, you know? So <laughs> whenever I, I talk with uh, Bayesian folks, it's kind of, that's the situation that always comes to mind. It's like, yes, what I'm talking about with confidence structures is much more difficult uh, because some, for some problems at least, getting the right answer is much more difficult. Um, so, it's yeah, that's, that's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it, uh, so, so you're basically solving one problem and then creating another problem. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that uh, there would be very interesting to see the development of that theory, but I uh, and see how it can be applied uh, in, in more wider applications. Uh, on the other hand, if, if uh, the route that, that I have taken is to sort of uh, try to implement um, uh, a Bayesian, uh, like a precise probability quantification as much as possible, and in case when I think that the assessment may not be, it may not hold for this particular assessment, then I can uh, extend it to do uh, use a robust Bayesian inference to consider taking into account the, some issues that I may encounter. And I, well, but, but uh, then and that I, begs, that yeah? begs the question: How do you anticipate where the uh, Bayesian approach will fail? Oh, that's based on uh, uh, like. As a, as a as a scientific uh, expert, you you have a you have an understanding of the data where it comes from. It you can trust it. You have an understanding of the problem, and you're discussing it. So it it's uh, these are always the kind of things that we that we work with that we we, we sort of uh, build ourselves an opinion about the problem. Well, such. The, in other words, guess, she, hmm? sorry, what sorry, am I doing? In other words, she doesn't know. Uh, I know. <laughs> well, well. So, so let me give a counterexample to that, um, yeah. which is, uh, of course, I'm always going to come back to this: the satellite conjunction analysis. Oh, please do. Where by I, I know, and I, I feel like you're kind of calling it out at the, at the beginning, and I couldn't get into it because my wife was in the same room on another Zoom call because we're all <laughs> working. But um, 
so that's kind of an example where looking at it by the usual metrics, everything looks great, you know, doing satellite conjunction analysis. You know, you've got copious data, you're very confident in your models, you've, um, you know, whatever prior you had, whatever reasonable non-informative-ish prior you could use has long ago been wiped out by the data. Uh, so by the usual metrics we apply in statistical inference, uh, you would look at that and be like, oh, I don't have to worry about my posterior. Everything's going to be great. So now I'll just compute my posterior probability of collision and everything's great. And it turns out that doesn't work <laughs> because it turns out um, even though you wiped out your prior, theoretically, even though your likelihood was converged, just using a prior induced this assumption that your uncertainty can be represented using an additive belief function. Or, or more simply, you assume that this is a probabilistic uncertainty when it actually isn't. And even though you wiped out your prior, et cetera, et cetera, it's still, you still have that lingering assumption of your mathematical form. And that turns out to be a very powerful assumption uh, with very dire consequences. Uh, and in the uh, satellite conjunction analysis, those dire consequences take the form of, you know, you'll be on a collision course, but no matter how, but you'll be guaranteed to think you're safe, basically, even if you're on a collision course. Mm. So that that's, you know, yeah. Now that's an example, you know, I know your presentation is about mixed uncertainty. You know, you've got uncertainty in the parameters, you're interested in the next sample. This is uh, satellite conjunction. I'm not interested in the next sample. Or, I'm yeah, not I, interested in the next sample. Okay, well. I'm, I'm saying that in scientific assessments, that's usually, when, when we're interested in next sample, it's usually when we when we want to sort of validate our model and see where it fits the okay. data, we make predictions and then we compare it to future observations. What I'm interested in is like, uh, how likely is it that someone will die? How many, uh, what, is the, what is the concentration that, uh, that uh, uh, a high exposure, high exposed person will have and so on. So we are making summaries over the electron uncertainty. That's what risk mm -hmm. assessment is about. We are not okay, describing so all possible cases that could occur. We're making relevant summaries that make sense to decision makers. We could be turning to cost benefit, utility, and whatnot. And so in satellite conjunction analysis, what I'm dealing with, what I'm interested in is whether or not these two satellites are going to collide. Uh, and that's kind of a fixed uncertainty. We don't have any kind of useful informative prior we could put on that. And But at the meta level, we are also interested in co uh, controlling the rate at which those collisions occur, yeah. um, which is why it really drives our frequentist view of uncertainty, is because we are literally trying to uh, limit the frequency at which those collisions occur. I, Unfortunately, I, yeah. yeah, and I, I have um, I have looked at this example, and I haven't had time to dig into the details let, yet. But okay. uh, in in the paper that you wrote. Um, and my suspicion, uh, you, it is that the model is uh, is uh, mixing electron epistemic uncertainty. It's uh, not. There's no mixture going on. There, it's just an epistemic uncertainty. Well, I, I, before you go, and as a side point, can yeah. either of you provide a very clear definition on what aleatory and epistemic is? Because I am literally trying to research this right now. Okay. The best paper I have is from 2009, which says aleatory or epistemic doesn't matter. And uh, that's not a good paper. <laughs> I mean, like, I can't, I can't, like, I've come up with a mathematical definition that works for me, but I, everybody talks about it as if everybody agrees as to what it means, but I haven't seen the simple equation. This is the equation for aleatory. There is this no, is the equation. There is no yeah. equation. It's a, it's a, it's, it's an a, assigned, it's an assigned meaning to, to, to things. So for example, if you throw a die, mm -hmm. you can think of it as electron uncertainty because you have a, 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 you can sort of specify, you know, each time you throw it, it's going to come up with a certain probability or chance something is going to come up. You can, can you can describe this chance in a very well uh, described way if your die is fair uh, and you can sort of look at it and you can throw it many times and you know that there is a by by chance or randomness there is an inherent property in 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 the in the system of throwing a die that you can describe 
Well, epistemic uncertainty is that, that we are uncertain about something that has a fixed number. So, that we, so, uh, or a so, you, so you can't be uncertain about something that has a random number? I can be uncertain about that, but that imposes that I have to first describe that variability. Okay, so let's say I have two, no, I have no, two no. hands. I mean, but the, let's say I have two hands. In one hand, I have the fair die. In one hand, I have the unfair yeah. die. Now, so each, think, each die has an associated uh, probability model to it. Yes, but, but you, I you know can be one, uncertain which one you have. So then yeah. I am uncertain which one you have, which one you're throwing. And when you, as soon as you, when you throw it, it's sort of generated by, by a model. So you can think of it as that, that uh, if you can sort of, if you can um, construct a data generating process, if you can sort of construct a probabilistic model for how data is generated, conditional on, on the probabilities of different outcomes of that. That's the electoral uncertainty, but the, the probabilities of different outcomes, that is epistemic. So, so if you, do you mind if I, I take a quick crack at yeah. uh, clarifying because, Joshua, you're the one with all the loaded die, right? Dice. I am, I am. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So if you've got a fair die and you're rolling that, or even if you've got a loaded die where you know how it's loaded, um, that's, um, that's aleatory uncertainty if you've got a well-characterized distribution. But if you've got a loaded die but you don't know how it's loaded, that uncertainty about how it's loaded, that's epistemic uncertainty. Yeah. And there's no mathematical equation for it, like um, Ulrich has said. But this is one thing but, we agree on. Well, um, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't the mathematical equation, an, couldn't it just be the, dis, the true distribution minus the distribution you think it is? Uh, and take like some norm of that? Because I mean, you no, would think like you need a way, because the idea is that if I have a loaded die and if I roll it an infinite number of times, we tend to agree the epistemic uncertainty is going to decrease until it's zero because now I know that distribution fully. Yeah. So, so you need, if the epistemic uncertainty decreases, you need to have some way to show that it decreases. So, it's, so, a, it's, an it's, a, it's an hierarchical model. You have, you have your, your uh, probability model for the die and then you have your probability model for, if you're using probabilities to describe epistemic uncertainty, you have your uncertainty model for the parameters and, uh, and you, you don't have to collapse it into one thing. It's, you just keep it separate. Oh, Ulrika, I wanna jump in real quick. Joshua, okay. you had mentioned not being able to find good literature on this. And so, so the first thing to your question is, there are people who propose a lot of metrics for epistemic uncertainty, for that uncertainty about what the true distribution is. Um, but, but the short answer is there's no definitive answer, but not yet anyway, but if you wanna like get into what some of those pay, uh, metrics are and what some people have proposed, George Kluhr is a good place to start. Okay, um, yeah, I've got, I've got his textbook. That was the one that okay. Scott recommended. I mean, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, to continue, so uh, the, the, the nature of epistemic uncertainty is that it is someone who is uncertain. It's, it depends on the state of knowledge you have. And even if two persons would have the identical knowledge, they could have different, they could be uncertain, they could have different, be uncertain in different ways. Uh, so, so yeah. the, the pure nature of epistemic uncertainty is a, it, it is uncertain. If you if you sort of define uncertainty as there is a true value of uncertainty, it presumes that you you have you have the possibility to sample and to sort of draw conclusions about some kind of objective uncertainty. But that's not that's not how I see the purpose of of assessments because then you can only work with problems where you have tons of data. And that's not where uncertainty is that relevant to work with. But isn't that how you're defining aleatory uncertainty, though? Where you know, I mean, like, for example, no, there's. Uh, uh, what, what, I, mean, um, I don't I mean, need data to have to, to work with aleatory uncertainty. But, well, you, don't you? I mean, like, other than that, it's not aleatory uncertainty. It's just you're assuming a, that a random variable has a certain distribution. I mean, to me, it becomes the aleatory uncertainty when you actually believe that's the way the random variable behaves. I mean, a random variable yeah. can have an infinite number of probability distributions, but we say, well, we think this is the correct one. And so therefore we're gonna call that specific probability measure the aleatory uncertainty, 
right? It's a, it's a, it's a model. We have a it's it's uh, it's we are modeling a letter uncertainty, but we but our model can uh, does the our model need parameters, and these parameters may capture epistem. Be, be, we can be uncertain about those. It's a <laughs> hmm. Um, I. So, so if if um, the distinction between a letter and epistemic in in, a, in environmental risk assessment, a letter is 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 usually referred to as variability, or inherent mm -hmm. randomness, and it's something that it's inherent in the system that you're looking at. It's, it could be like that the uh, there is a fluctuation in, in the temperature somewhere, and you can describe these fluctuations as uh, some by some random model, or stochastic you, model. Could, you could have epistemic uncertainty about a variable that turns out to be aleatory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and of course your model could be wrong, and you could sort of make the wrong assumptions yeah. I, and so on. Yeah. I, I guess I always just feel people use the word aleatory uncertainty when they really mean that in a model. This is a random variable. It's not a constant, and we're going to call yeah, that aleatory and, uncertainty. Yeah, and, it's and like, that's not uh, so. In the Bayesian approach, and uh, in the in the, if you if you use a Bayesian approach, because we're using probabilities for both. So technically, mathematically, both epistemic and aleatory uncertainty are characterized by by uh, random variables. So one can think, oh, so they are both uh, expressing randomness. But it's just a mathematical construct, and then the interpretation assigned to these are, are different. But I disagree completely with that. Yeah, idea. please. <laughs> well, uh, do you, I, Scott and I had a conversation uh, that kind of parallels the question that Josh is asking years and years ago uh, when we were in New York. Um, and and I, I'd like to throw this in here, which is so, Josh, Joshua, you're noticing that you need a bunch of data to justify a pure aleatory uncertainty. And, um, you know, I guess one question you could ask is how is it even an uncertainty when you have that much data? And uh, one, something I said that's got a long time ago, which is like, it doesn't be, it's uncertain because you're interested in one outcome. You know what I mean? You're interested in a particular outcome from yeah, that I random distribution. And to kind of make it really, I mean, one of the reasons I like the formal mathematical definition of probability measure is because to me it's so clear. And so like if I take a fair die where we know what the value, we know that it's, we know it's distribution and I roll it and I think the outcome is going to be a five or I hope the outcome is going to be a five, but it turns out to be a two. Is that epistemic uncertainty? I but, thought it was going to be a five. It turned out to be a two. Is that Elliot? And it's like it's. I mean, it's, it's a it depends on what you're applying it on. So the mathematical definition of probability doesn't have an interpretation assigned to it. Kolmogorov didn't in, give, didn't give an interpretation to probability, the that he was talking about. This was just a mathematical measure. Well, no, no, and then that's to, why. To, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. To further confuse things, like, could it be epistemic uncertainty if? when the dice comes up, like one of the dots has been partially rubbed off and it's difficult to tell if it's a two or a three. Like it, it's yeah, that's a that's a source of that's a source of epistemic uncertainty, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. But it's yeah. it's in your observation that is you only have partial information. Yeah. But it's uh, uh it's it's another it's how to say then you have to sort of impose a model for that as well. Which you I could. I guess the only distinction I've often heard people make is like, oh, one's reducible and one's irreducible. Well, and reducible I think that, is. Uh, yeah, I know, I agree. And I think that's a horrible distinction. Yeah, because me, it's, if, it could actually increase when you get more information. If I yeah. could add, basically, uh, I think the simplest way I remember is that epistemic deals with knowledge, like how well do you know something? It is not quantifiable, whereas for aleatory, it's more quantifiable because you can, uh, it's, it's more of like, statistical uncertainty like you know if you do a science experiment you take multiple readings because you want to reduce the best reduce the like like you know you want to account for the noise and all that this these are like aleatory uncertainties where there is like stuff where it's due to statistical error so that's I how would, i usually um, quantify i, I, I would try to avoid defining epistemic uncertainty as something that isn't quantifiable because we have that's yeah. what we've been talking oh, about this I whole mean, seminar <laughs> correct i say like we can quantify it but if not for all this framework we wouldn't have been able to quantify it that's that's what i was trying to mean if not for all this framework we would not have been able to put them in numbers but epistemic is more of like knowledge based uncertainty 
It is due to limitations yeah. in knowledge, yes. Right. And uh, if you look deeply into it, uh, your your uh, uh, what is a literary depends on how you describe the system. So if you describe it in in every tiny little bit detail, uh, a lot of things can be epistemic. But if you choose to make summaries, like the like you sort of look at the variation within this population or something, and then you assign a distribution for that. So it it also depends on how you define the system you're looking at. What is a literary? Uh, and if you go into the smaller, tiny it atoms of everything, everything is epistemic. And this is, for example, uh, mentioned in a book by Anthony Hagen, who is a, uh, he's working with subjective probabilities, uh, so characterization of epistemic and so on. That's quite a good book if you want to read something, Joshua. Yeah. Which oh book was it? Oh um, my God. Gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, want, you want to write it down in the, in the chat? <laughs> Does it, would, would it be reasonable just thinking about aleatory uncertainty as uncertainty where frequentist probability makes sense as an application. Yeah. Ep epistemic <laughs> doesn't really suit being represented by frequentist probabilities, but through something like intervals as a representation, you can, you can quantify it, but it's not necessarily a probability at that point. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, I would avoid defining epistemic uncertainty in relation to whether you can quantify it using probability or not. Uh, not because it's throwing out uh, subjective probability as a way to quantify epistemic uncertainty, because I think that anyone working with uncertainty, uh, this is a very powerful and widely applied framework. So, uh, if if we're going to define epistemic uncertainty as something that we can't quantify by probability we are making a we are making a self a very big disfavor well, well but Ul ulrika it is true that aleatory uncertainty is uh it, the distinction he's making is not oh we can't use probability theory i think there are reasons we can't but that let's it's, leave that story for another day <laughs> but the definition he's offering and i think it's a hundred percent correct it's the simplest definite well not just simple it, it's correct which is it's where we can justify the application of probability in frequentist terms. So, and, and uncontroversially. Uh, yeah, un uncontroversially. And uh, another good book, which predates Kolmogorov, uh, would be George Boole, to look into how that frequentist definition of probability induces all the mathematical pro uh, properties that we uh, associate with probability theory. Although I wouldn't suggest reading that to end to end, just skim it. It's very tedious. But um, uh, it's um, that that's the definition. And epistemic uncertainty, if anything, is very just a catch-all term for everything else, which is a very broad category. Um, like epistemic uncertainty really doesn't have an active definition; it has a negative definition. It's everything that's not aleatory uncertainty. And I've always been sensitive to the possibilities that we could, in the future at least, start peeling off categories of uncert epistemic uncertainty as their own uncertainty type. Um, yeah, that, that's all. Yeah. But yeah, he, yeah um, he's not saying, oh, we can, you know, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but you weren't saying that it's only you know, this is the only application of probability. It's just aleatory uncertainty is the only application of probability that can be justified in frequentist terms. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, and I, I think that's the best definition for aleatory uncertainty that exists. Like a, everything else just confuses people. My, my, my to hopefully this might just be the last word because this is a topic we've beaten it like a dead horse. But to my mind, the epistemic uncertainty is the primary thing. It's the thing that we have first. Um, and it's just the fact that we don't know what the number is going to be. Right? Aleatory uncertainty is actually, essentially, it's extra information that's come in because we understand some of the structure of a problem that has generated what effectively is, turns out to be a distribution or a probability. And when we know that situation, then we can characterize what was epistemic uncertainty now becomes aleatory simply because it's a finite range of things or, or maybe not even finite it's a range of things and we can characterize 
by probabilities. That you know, and if and if we know them, if we know all those probabilities, then we don't have any more epistemic uncertainty. It's all aleatory. But you in mean, general, you mean prob Scott, you mean with probabilities here, you mean specifically as frequencies, right? Yeah, I or, do. I, right. I, okay. I remember walking with you actually in Lugano or someplace. <laughs> We were talking about this with Vladek, and the question was, you know, can you use probability distributions to characterize the epistemic uncertainty that we're talking about? Ulrika says, yes, absolutely, you have to because the whole world is doing it. You know, oh. just, because, just because everybody's jumping off a bridge, Ulrika, you wouldn't jump off a bridge, would you? Well, um, I, I don't, uh, I don't. It, it depends argument. why they're jumping off the bridge. You don't have. <laughs> I just don't buy that as an argument. I, I'm, I'm not convinced that a probability distribution... I'm, I'm not saying that you have to use it, but I'm saying that uh, it is, it is, uh, one has to be, one has to under, one has to understand it and, and, uh, and, uh, and be able to work with it if it's required. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's, um, it's, it's like, uh, it's like walking if you're working with uncertainty. Galileo that you should taught, know. Galileo taught astrology. You can work with these things. <laughs> do, you, do you mean you can work with them without believing them? Of course, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's, yes, I, of course. <laughs> I, I think, like, to, to me, it feels like you can take this kind of approach as long as you are happy, like, losing the, the sort of, like, the very frequentist sense of, like, confidence in your output. It, as long as you're aware of that, you can still, like, to, to sort of guide subjective, like subjective probabilities or beliefs, it feels like yeah, there's there's still value in this, but it's understanding that it's it feels like it's something very different. Yeah, yeah. So I I agree. I, I agree. I think, I mean, if you look at uh, the language of betting, that's the same as the language of probability, right? So if you think of everything as betting, and I'm just describing how I will behave with regards to bets, then that's fine, and then you just forget about the frequency. You don't don't necessarily assign a frequency interpretation yeah. to your outcome, especially if you start to mix those two things. And I can understand uh, Ulrika's desire for keeping an Bayesian analysis, an Bayesian analysis where some part of the model is clearly has a frequentist interpretation, and where, uh, where or an aleatory, where you can see it as an aleatory model, and then you have this uh, more subjective part, which is which is more epistemic, and you're gonna mix those together. Uh, 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 like a hardcore Bayesian may not care so much about having mixed those together, but in a practical risk assessment, maybe you want in the end, in the end result, you want to keep that distinction somehow. And I think that's that's uh, that's a very reasonable uh, thing to do, even though maybe some Bayesians don't like that. Um, but yeah. So I, I don't understand what you're saying, Matthias. Um, so. I'm confused. So, what's the relationship between a betting perspective and what? And secondly, uh, do we have to, if we're taking bets, do we have to either buy or sell any bet that's offered? You know, are we precise? Therefore, if we're taking bets, uh, we 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 may or we may not, right? We may or we may not. So, so yeah. So in, in Definetti, if you take Definetti, yes, you have to either buy or sell any bet, right? You have no choice. But if you right. just extend this a bit and say I relax that, I go to Wally, -E, you get kind of the whole probability bounding, which which is uh, which uh, is uh, what uh, Ulrika is trying to defend here, uh, which which I'm also defending. Um, but uh, yeah, so there is the, the language of probability is totally valid from if you if you just totally forget about uh, frequency, the, the frequency interpretation, just think about bats, which perfectly work. You don't need any repeatable situation for that. It's clear, very subjective. It, uh, it seems appropriate for also epistemic, representing epistemic uncertainty. It's kind of a full framework for doing that. Uh, and I think you only get in trouble when you're trying to uh, impose an aleatory like if you think of probability as purely aleatory and then you try to impose that to do something that involves epistemic uncertainty and that's i think where maybe some of the confusion comes from yeah. because of uh because because you, you're if, you, if you're not willing to 
uh, take a broader view of, of, of probability theory and think of it, for example, as a way of representing best or something else that's maybe compatible uh, with an epistemic view, then uh, yeah, uh, you're gonna but, run into trouble. I don't no? know why, I mean, what, what's the, I mean, you can get into trouble betting too, uh, at least people. Yes, yes, of course, yeah, sure you can, sure, yeah. I mean, um, that's uh, that, that's uh, that's what um, uh, whenever we do an assessment, there is uh, Niels Erik Salin. He is talking about epistemic risk, which is uh, the risk of being wrong, and uh, and uh, that is something that we have to manage, and uh, that is why that's why one as a as a as an honest uh, pers assessor using uh, uh, subjective probability to quantify uncertainty. Uh, in order to manage epistemic risk, one may consider to, to use uh, bounded probability. Uh, and, and the virtue of that is to sort of take into account that there could be issues here that, that uh, make my precise probabilities less confident. And I'm sort of expanding it a bit to take that into account. I can still see what's going on because I have a, a, a higher level, uh, a higher order uncertainty attached to my epistemic uncertainty. And I can still use the, the, the features in the Bayesian machinery. And if, if my uncertainty would reduce, it sort of collapses back into precise probability again. So I think this is a really, really useful approach that, that could be used uh, even in science.